I hereby call the Brockton School Committee to order it being Tuesday, February 6, 2024, 7 p.m. We are here at 474 Ave, Brockton High School, 02301 in the George M. Rahm Little Theater. I need to read the following into the record. Uh, dear visitors, visitors, welcome to a meeting of the Brockton School Committee. This is the agenda that will be discussed this evening. Please note that the hearing of visitors is included. We have our sign-in. It's limited to three minutes at time. If you have a statement or question, please give your name to the secretary. Uh, Mrs. Campbell uh, serves in that capacity, and I was given the, uh, the sign-ins. In addition to attending, the public can view this meeting via television on Comcast Channel 8 and also on the 1071 HD version and also online uh, via the following link, which is www.youtube.com slash the Brockton Channels. I would ask that we please stand and salute the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. I will now uh, establish a quorum. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Here. Mr. Gomes. Here. Ms. Ehlers. Here. Ms. Oliver. Here. Mr. Rodriguez. Here. Ms. Azak. Here. Mr. Sullivan. Here. I'm here as well. We are joined by Anthony, the student representative, so thank you for being here tonight, Anthony. I, I know you'll be speaking in a moment. We have established a quorum. Uh, agenda one has been completed. Agenda two is the hearing of visitors, and again, we do have quite a few people that have signed in. I will start with number one, uh, Terry McIntosh, please. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Terry McIntosh. I am the president of the Brockton Special Education Parent Advisory Council. A lot of you may know it by Brockton CPAC. Um, it is a group that we, um, Brockton, needs to have. Um, and I can tell you as a parent, it's been very helpful to me. Um, we've had a lot of support this past year with um, Jamie um, Langley, in, uh, Assistant Director of um, Exceptional Students. Um, we've always had a problem with attendance. Sometimes with this particular pack, you either have at the end of each year, we get the parents together at the meeting, and they tell us what they want to see and speak as they want for the next year. So the reason I'm here for this evening, um, one of the suggestions were they wanted to invite the school committee members. Um, so that's why I'm here as the president to invite you to our March 6th um, meeting, 7.30. It starts at 7 to 8.30 in the Azure Calf at Brockton High. That's where our meetings are. Um, I believe Melinda put um, our calendar in all of your packets tonight, but we would love to have you come. Um, we've done this in the past, and it's, it's gone great, because as a parent, I know, especially as a special ed parent of two boys in Brockton, I have a child at the Baker School and at the Ashfield, and I know how importantly every one of your seats are here. And I'm sorry I didn't say good evening to the mayor and Dr. Cobbs and all the members. I, I appreciate every one of you. But I know that our school system can't afford to have every special ed program in our neighborhood schools. So as a city councilor or a school committee member that you are, my children may be going to a program at the Baker School for special ed, but I may live in a different district, you know, or not district, I'm sorry, a ward. So it's so important, and I, I know you must all feel this, that you're just not representing your ward like, you know, 50 years ago we had, we all went to Brookfield School, like I did, because I lived in that area. But it's not like that right now, especially for special ed. And Brockton has some dynamic programs for special ed that I'm probably the biggest cheerleader you'll ever see for special education in Brockton, because it works. Your teachers are amazing. I see them right now wearing many hats, but they're doing it with smiles. The principals, the assistant principals, they you know, they know the children, they're smiling. And that needs to continue, and I want to thank them personally. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed, and I know it doesn't go unnoticed to any of you, and we can't let that go unnoticed, because we have some amazing special ed staff and administrators, um, and the whole school staff. They're so welcoming to the special ed students. 
Um, I have experience, like I said, at this time at the Baker and the Ashfield Middle School and prior to Downey. And I know some of you are very, go to all of your PTA meetings and I think that's wonderful. I've seen Mr. Sullivan, every one of this. I'm sorry, your time meeting. is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you March 7th, 6th. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> William Wells, please. You can hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. <laughs> Mayor, school committee, how's everyone doing? Good evening. My name is William Wells. Up until January for almost 10 years, I was a BPS community mentor. I'm here tonight to show my support for my kids at BHS and their well-being. We know what the issues are. I'm not going to repeat them. What I would like to do is be part of the solution to help. Even though I no longer work in the district, I still feel a responsibility to help my kids and the school committee, um, community with a few ideas and have, I have in mind. I am also here tonight to encourage BPS in doing a better job at staff retention. This district has lost a lot of good people for multiple reasons. I would like to encourage the school committee to help our district find ways to keep the good, effective, and talented staff in these schools. Schools cannot, cannot consistently function without support staff and teachers. In order to see changes, in order to uh, change a culture, we have to find ways to work together for the sake of our students, schools, and staff. All schools need staff who can successfully, successfully build relationships, not just, not just with our students, but with everyone who plays a part in that child's life, growth, and development. And the district needs to continue to find ways to keep staff like this in every school. And Ms. Ehlers, am I saying it right? Yes. You're Ward 1. I'm also Ward 1. I would like to set up a time to sit down and speak with you and okay. talk to you about my ideas. Just whatever I can do to help, because like, I want to do everything I can for these kids, especially for my kids that are having a hard time. So uh, I'll reach out to you via email. We'll set up a time to meet. We'll talk about some of the solutions I have, and hopefully we can uh, get some things done for I these kids. Like Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank have you a good night, all. everyone. Thank you. Next person is uh, Addison Shaw, please. Good evening, members of the school committee. My name is Addison Shaw, and I'm a sophomore student in the Azure building. Almost every person who has spoken here has said negative things about Rockton High. I'm not denying that there are issues that need to be improved at the school, but today I'd like to focus on the positive. As a student at Brockton High, I'm on the varsity cheer team, the advanced concert choir, and a member of the drama club. The level of courses offered here far exceeds any other high school. The number of honors in AP courses, early college courses, and classes in all subject areas are extensive. The opportunities that this school has presented have been honestly life-changing. I participated in the Southeastern District Music Festival, which allowed me to meet so many new people. This summer, I'm going to Europe for a month and will be performing in five different countries. I have had amazing teachers who are always there for the students. Miss Liberty, who always makes sure that students understand material before moving on to another topic. Miss Bezra, who recently retired but always cared for every student she taught and even the one she didn't. Mr. Cunningham, who has helped me grow as a musician and a, sorry, and a singer. Mr. McGee, who is always flexible with classwork and making sure that everyone is on the right track. My bio teacher, Miss G, who welcomed me into her class in the middle of the year. Miss Tucker and the staff in the Yellow IRC, who always offer a quiet place for kids to do their work. And my cheer coach, Coach Doyle, who helps me reach my full potential as an athlete in person. In my experience, I've always had a guidance or adjustment counselor who has helped me change classes, make my schedule, and plan for college. The Azure office staff are always willing to help me fix any problems that I have. The 10% of students who cause problems at this school are recognized more often than the other 90% of students who are doing the right thing, getting good grades, and who are always on the right track. We need to acknowledge and invest in these students just as much as we do for the students who are struggling. I am proud to be a BHS student, and I hope that we can focus our energy on solving the disruptions, but not forgetting about the majority of us who are making good choices and great things. Thank you for your time.
Next, uh, Melissa McLaughlin, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Picture this, a classroom buzzing with the sound of students' fingers tapping away on their smartphones. Their attention divided between the lesson at hand and the latest notifications on their screens. It's a scene all too familiar in many schools today, yet as convenient as cell phones may be, may seem their unrestricted use in schools can have serious consequences. First and foremost, allowing cell phones in schools can lead to a host of distractions, hindering students' abilities to focus and engage in their studies. Studies have shown that the mere presence of a cell phone, even if it's turned off, can significantly impair cognitive function. Imagine the impact on classroom learning when students are constantly tempted to check their phone for messages, social media updates, their latest sale on whatever the Mercari or their up, and also play their games. The issue goes beyond their distractions. I've heard parents say we need cell phones for emergencies. Myself, I've raised three children, and they had cell phones, but they were not allowed to have them on in school. And if I texted them, and they answered me, and they were in school, that cell phone was lost. It can lead to feelings of isolation, anxiety. Consider this scenario. A student receives news of a family emergency during class, but is unable to step out to process their information in private. Instead, they're forced to confront, confront their emotions in front of their peers, adding an unnecessary layer of stress and trauma to an already difficult situ situation. Let's not forget the potential for tragedy in times of crisis. Imagine the chaos that can ensue if students were glued to their phones during a major emergency. As a teacher who was here at BHS during 9-11, I can only imagine the trauma students would have felt with all the true and untrue news reports they would have gotten. As a trusted adult, I was able to disseminate the information and help students to understand this emergency instead of following and instead of following established safety protocols and seeking guidance from school authorities, students might be inundated with conflicting information from social media and news apps, leading to panic and confusion. As a school, we're training students for when they're out in the real world, and there are many careers that do not allow cell phones, from military during basic training, corrections offices, and even surgeons. Imagine your surgeon checking their Instagram in the middle of your heart surgery. It's imperative that we recognize the need to restrict the use of cell phones in schools. By implementing the yonder pouches and limiting access to cell phones during emergencies, we can ensure that students receive accurate information and guidance from trusted sources, minimizing the risk of further harm and confusion. In conclusion, the unrestricted use of cell phones in schools possesses serious risk to students' academic performance, mental well-being, and safety. By implementing sensible restrictions, we, we can create a safer and more productive learning environment for all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Julie Fairfield, please. I want to thank you for last week. Um, I'm going to talk about chapter 222, so no crying today. Um, first of all, I want to say about the cell phones. Um, I tell my students, um, when I was in high school, my mom had to call the school to, if there was an emergency. Um, and one of my students said, do they allow you to film in the hallways when you were in high school? And I was like, I don't think I could have carried a camera that was that big. But, um, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of glad that they didn't have them. I don't think I would want my life to be out there, you know. I, I also want to, I don't know who to ask this, uh, the absence policy, I know a new one was put in place, but I don't know like what ever happened with that. But Mr. Rodriguez, I blame you for this because you piqued my interest. Um, I've heard about Chapter 222 since I've been here. Never thought to, I don't like students being suspended. I don't want my kids being suspended. I want them there. I want them, if they're in my classroom, they're gonna learn. Um, I've always been told, like, you're so good with those kids. <laughs> like, those kids. Uh, but I was those kids. You know, I was the kid who hated being, in, I hated high school. Hated it, which is kind of ironic. But I did, and this is just the research I printed out, um, I did a lot of research on it, and I was really sad. Um, I can understand why they would want to put this in place. But uh, the failure in the design, the failure in the implementation, and the failure in follow-up. I mean, 
it was, it's so hard to find anything, any kind of studies that have been done on the impact. The studies that I did find, to every single one of them, it did not reduce racial uh, disparity. It did not reduce disparity for um, people with disabilities. So, I mean, in 10 years, that, that's a huge failure to me. And, you know, I know, I teach statistics, I know correlation doesn't prove causation, but um, I don't know, as I've been, like, researching it, the bad behaviors that have increased, and also, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but test scores. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, because if you're, if people are disrupting your learning, that's got to have an effect on you. And um, I don't know, I was just going to throw it out there. But, um, you know, there's no financial backing for any of the so-called ideas that they had for this and no guidance for the alternatives. And I was really shocked about that. You know, they talk about um, mentoring and collaborative justice. Oh, no, excuse me, collaborative support. And I was like, and uh, restorative justice. And I'm like, how do you do that with someone who doesn't think they did anything wrong? I'm sorry, so, your time is up. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, and I just, I don't know what we can do about it. Um, if I were a parent with a kid at the school, my child also has a constitutional right to an education. So, thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline Jones, please. Good evening. I am a proud graduate of Brockton High School, 1975. I also am the mother of Brockton High School graduates. This today is not the Brockton High that I graduated from, and it pains me. That's why I'm here tonight. When I also I want to just echo Ms. McLaughlin, and I want to echo the young lady, so that's going to give me a little more time because I don't have to say exactly what they said. <laughs> Um, I feel that school committee, you are elected and you are expected to put policies and practice in, in place that keep students and staff safe. It has not been done. The school, Broughton High School, has not had a comprehensive policy to student management since Sue Zach left. Those of you that knew Sue Zach would know there are just things that would not happen on her watch. It would not. There are things that I see in the school, bonnets. Who decided that bonnets are okay? Who decided that one-piece pajamas are okay? Who decided that I say there should be no? No boobs showing, no boxes showing, no bellies showing, no butt showing, and no blankets. Full blankets being worn by students and staff. Do you know what would happen if I had a student in Brockton High and if my student tripped and fell because someone was walking around with a blanket, $14 million would be the least of the issue. So the policies and practices, I'm sorry, school committee, I put this at your feet. You cannot allow yourself to be bullied by the parents who are themselves being told what to do by their children. I know that there had been a policy suggested about the phones and everyone backed away from it. My granddaughter goes to school in another state. She is a junior. Phones are taken by everyone. As soon as they come in, they put them in these little cages. It might be that sack you're talking about. I don't know what the name of it. Everyone puts them in cages. We do not like that we have to take our shoes off to get on the airport, right? We, we, we can't, we don't like that. But tell the people you're not taking off your shoes, you won't be flying. It just became a cultural norm. New cultural norms have to be established. And when I hear that they're only kids, I'll say to you, this generation has had violence normalized in a way that is unlike any other generation. So no, it's not kid stuff when a six-year-old can bring a gun to shoot at his teacher because he's mad at her. Not, in our, not here in Brockton, but you know in another state, six years old, he bought a gun to school. That's not kid stuff. So they may be kids chronologically, but their obsession with violence has made this not kid stuff. Get rid of the phones, that'll stop the violence because nobody will want to be filmed. Um, some of you may know, 1966, Kitty Genovese was murdered in New York City. 
30, what murdered in New York City, that's not unusual. But she was in front of 38 witnesses. Each one of the witnesses said they didn't do anything because they thought someone else was going to do it. I'm sorry, Today, if that happened, it would be that somebody's filming it. That's why no one would have time to help her. So please get rid of the phones and bring a dress code policy that is practical. I put that on you. Thank you. Liz Corbett, please. Liz Corbett. Hi again. Good evening, school committee members. Um, please learn to chew gum and walk at the same time. What do I mean by this? BHS is both in a terrible state and deserves a new building. An improved building can solve some of these behavior issues. I love my students. I love BHS. I have said this before. I bleed red and black. It is my home. What I'm going to say is for clarity. My classroom has no windows. The thermostat is unreliable at best. Spaghetti straps, blankets, who knows what kids are wearing, who knows what temperature it is. We have four electrical outlets for 30 students. We were told not to use extension cords. Yeah, yeah. I invite all of you to schedule a tour of BHS. I would love to show you the traffic between Azure and Green on the second floor. I was period subbing. I don't have a prep anymore because I've given that up. And I got a binder to the stomach and an elbow to the back. I was nice about it because I'm a grown up, but man, that hurt. So come with me, middle of uh, the passing period. You'll, you'll love it. Please come see the hole in the wall outside of my classroom. Is it for a rodent? Is it a water stain? Who knows? I don't know. Come see the poor quality of the children's bathrooms. They're children. The bathrooms are disgusting. They look like they don't even belong in Massachusetts, let alone in the United States. Please observe students making their way out of the building at various times of the day. We don't have security in that regard. They're children. They're leaving the building. And local parientes, not so much. The state has a financial plan to support our students. That's what this new building, this is this opportunity. Don't let this great financial opportunity pass us by because the adults can't get their stuff together. Thank you. Gwen Knowles, please. Gwen Knowles. Good evening. I am also a proud graduate, 1980, of Brockton High School, and my child is a graduate as well. I have not been before the school committee since Mike Thomas became superintendent, and I have not spoken since the hearing of the visitors since 2008. But what I saw last week um, with teachers crying, um, many who um, I've worked with. I did uh, work for a college support program for 14 years here at Brockton High School. Had relationships with people and to see what Brockton High has descended into is very, very disturbing. I'm an educator in another district, but I'm Brockton through and through and I had to come and speak here. Also, I wanted my fellow educators to know I'm a dog with you in this fight, that I support you, because it didn't seem like that was part of what went on last week, that you were being made to feel that you weren't doing what you needed to do. They're just kids. And a statement was made about working in a prison and not being afraid of criminals, the criminals. The prisoners have consequences. Unfortunately, the students do not. So there's a difference. Um, School Committee Oliver, you made a good point to include the parents in helping to solve this. Um, School Committee Azak, 
you apologize to the educators because of what they were experiencing. And thank you uh, for that. The students are afraid of no one. The parents are afraid of them. The school staff is afraid of the students. And the students are afraid of no one. That has to change. That can't be right and that can't sit right with anyone here that you're gonna take victims, being the staff, and turn them into someone that needs to do better and, and stand up and, and in which way would that be? There are models that work and there are things that are out there and, um, you know, that I'll be willing to share um, some models that work in regards to being able to bring control back. Brockton High was a model school six years in a row. I was up here at the time when representatives from Japan came here because of the great work that was do, um, being done here. And even though it is maybe a small population of students, they're making it very unsafe here. I'm sorry, your time is up. I'm done, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mary Lasavita, please, Mary Lasavita. Good evening. Um, I'd like to follow up on, I believe it was something that Ms. Jones was saying. Um, I'd like to thank the committee and Dr. Cobbs. Um, I have two requests. One is that uh, the policies, particularly the cell phone policy that's going to be discussed tonight, I would like to request that thoughtful policies be put into place. Here's what I mean. There was a lot of discussion last week about the yonder bags that hadn't been discussed in a while. Um, I sat down with the group of honors kids and discussed the policy with them because one of their teachers spoke with them the next day about the meeting last Wednesday. Um, they shredded your policy in seconds. A bunch of them said, well, the metal detectors are either not going to pick up our phones, so we're going to say we left them at home, so we don't need the bag, and we're going to walk in with our phones. Or there's not enough staff at the doors, so if the metal detector goes off, they usually just let kids go. So I want to bring you back to something that I said over the summer, and various people in administration told me to sit down, shut up, and go away. Um, we need volunteers in the school. We have a lot of volunteers that I've worked with over the last few months that want to help. These policies, without more people at the doors and the metal detectors, they will fail and then you're just empowering the kids again and we're gonna keep getting in this cycle. So that's point number one. Talk to the students and make thoughtful policies and think about the unintended consequences. These were honor students. Um, number two, I'd like to ask where we are on the audit. It's been um, two months that the contract has been ready to sign and you know, instead of rushing to respond to the crowd reaction, um, a lot of times these meetings feel like um, deja vu parents and teachers and community members come up here and we say things. We talk about the cell phone policy, we talk about security, metal detectors, all those things. And here we are again talking about the same things that we're going round and around and there's gonna be kids going through metal detectors with cell phones. Um, I believe this is failed leadership on the part of the mayor who is chairing the committee. Um, so for the rest of you, I would ask to just please implement thoughtful policies because most of you I know are capable of that. Thank you. Michelle Bonchek, please. Michelle Bonchek. Good evening. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and a former student tonight, so I apologize because I'm going to talk a little faster. I always talk fast anyway, but um, first my student, because she's more, uh, her voice needs to be heard. Um, I am Marissa Frenti and I can't be there tonight, but I am a 2023 graduate from the Azure House. Tonight I'd like to share my story. When people ask me about BHS, I tell people it was a four year trip to hell and I'm lucky to have made it out alive. My junior year was when Brockton High really started to change for the worse. I barely went to school. It wasn't because I didn't want to go. 
It was because I was scared too. Every day I stepped through those doors, I was having anxiety attacks because of gun and bomb threats. My safety was never promised, even with the metal detectors. Now knowing the metal detectors are at their lowest setting, it explains more. The metal detectors are supposed to keep students and staff safe. An eye-opening moment that really showed me I was not safe was in May of 2023. I was leaving to go to work when I saw a kid running past me talking about we're going to F this kid up and an and S ton of people are ganging up on him already. And I overheard the teachers talking about how there may be a knife involved. When I looked up, I heard that it, and I saw a person got stabbed. And that's when the teachers outside were rushing over to her and they put a dirty shirt over the wound. It was the only thing that they had. I stopped to give them a clean shirt out of my bag and I stayed to help. Her head was on the ground and they were just putting pressure on her leg when it should have been raised. I helped, care, I helped them care for her. Um, after that, nobody came and talked to her, by the way. Nobody followed up with her to see if she was okay after that experience. Um, and she ends by saying, I still get the crumbly feeling I had when I saw it happen. The school needs an intervention. So that's from Marissa um, Franette. And then from me, oh great, I got a minute, okay. Uh, you wanted people to contact you, but for years now have done nothing to make the staff in your district trust you. People have been telling you for years now what is happening at BHS. I personally stood before you at least twice and told you how I was verbally assaulted multiple times a day by students who received no consequences. I told you that I loved BHS, but my mental health was suffering because of working here. And nothing was done, and that was two years ago. As we all heard during Wednesday's meeting, things are getting worse and worse. Mr. Rodriguez, you told us to hold our coworkers accountable. But the fact is no one is holding students accountable, which is why my coworkers are unable to work effectively. You also said shame on those teachers who closed the petitions, which is an incredibly upsetting thing to hear. In a district that has a long history of retaliatory behavior, I do not think you fully understand the consequences for teachers who do not do what their bosses tell them to. I'm sorry, your time is up. Great. I just want to say, come up and shadow people for a day. Go and sit with the teacher. Spend their whole day with them. Follow them around. That's how you'll get something done. The last uh, hearing of this is Jazeel Barros, please. Good afternoon, my name is Jaziel Barros and I'm a junior class student at Brockton High School. Today I would like to thank every administrator and every teacher and every parent and every student here. But um, as a student at Brockton High, first of all, I would like to say that in the media and in like the committee meetings and everything, I'm constantly being here, like students being put in a bad light. Although there is a group of students and there is like students just like in any community that are doing things that are not supposed to be done, I would like to put the put the light on those who do what they do what they're supposed to be done and also I would like to say that we're not monsters and we're not prisoners and also I would like to say that as a prop like a problem that the student the community that we have here exists is the fact that there's no connection between administrators teachers and parents and students I see that connection growing further and further apart every day and I think that's like one of the main problems because if you, you could sit up here and I could talk about the problems that I see and going on and everything like that, but if I'm not in the community and I'm not um, able to connect with the students and with the teachers, then it's in vain. No one's going to listen to you. A lot of, a lot of, you have to give respect to get respect in return. And also I would like to speak on certain like, um, I don't know how to say this, this is, I'm very nervous. Um, I would like to say that like, also, there is disrespect given by students, and there is disrespect given from student, um, from teachers to students. And there needs to be a level of understanding that has to be met. And for that to happen, we need more conversation with students and staffs. We need more conversation within the community, and we need more community outreach. We can't be sitting here um, pointing fingers towards each other because it will not, nothing will be done. We need to be more connected as a united front to attack the problems that there is in this community. That's all.
you for everybody that spoke tonight hearing of visitors. Uh, that concludes agenda item two. Agenda item three is the report of superintendent of schools uh, acting superintendent, Dr. James Cobbs. Doctor. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, school committee members. Uh, first of all, business, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jang. Um, he's president of the Educational Divide Reform, EDR Institute, based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. EDR has been working with Brockton Public Schools since 2020 to offer programs designed to increase achievement and higher education opportunities for the district's multilingual learners. The Step, the step Up program works with multilingual learners in grade four to eight in the summer. The Pathfinder program provides college and career exploration at UMass Boston for multilingual learners in grades 11 and 12, and then helps students navigate the higher education ex application experience. Dr. Jang is here tonight to discuss an opportunity for a few high school students to, to participate in an international travel experience in Korea in May of 2024. Dr. Jang. Uh, thank, you. thank you for kind introduction. Um, I make a very special trip because of my special boat after my ankle surgery. Um, but anyway, because of a time constraint, let me get to the point directly. Um, I'm here because uh, I'm trying to offer a very fantastic opportunity to uh, Brockton student, student community uh, because I am uh, invited to the Asian Leadership uh, Conference to speak. Um, and I will try to uh, cover theme like uh, social inclusion education and the uh, U.S.-Korea alliance uh, issue. Um, because my job is actually, as I told you, uh, education divide reform uh, representative, and also I'm serving uh, UMass Boston as a Korean Peninsula Project Director too. Um, so I'm planning to invite three model students from Brockton High School for around one week. And we plan to in uh, an <coughs> accommodation, of course, you know, attending the conference the, and sightseeing and other costs uh, will be covered uh, by um, the, organi the organizing the uh, Joseon Daily News and also my organization together. Uh, but we, we need your support to identify suitable students. Um, and I, you know, uh, that's actually, that's why I'm coming here. Um, I'll talk a little bit that the uh, Asian Leadership Conference is actually a very high profile international event where even former U.S. President Obama and Bush and Mrs. Michelle Obama and the United Kingdom Prime Minister Johnson and other um, national leaders were also invited as keynote speakers in past years. So I think that's a great, great opportunity for Brockton students. Of course, I cannot invite you know thousand students, but I think at least uh, the representative uh, that uh, the Brockton school community, uh, I think they will be a uh, good messenger, I think, uh, you know, about global issues and also their potential leadership ability. That's my hope. Um, what basically is a relationship between the, the, you know, me or my organization with, with Brockton, why I'm bringing this opportunity to um, Brockton community? Well, Mayor, Mayor Sullivan, is, of course, you know, pretty uh, long story that uh, uh, introduced me to you, but let me briefly, you know, the relationship uh, between us and uh, um, Brockton. Uh, the pa next page, next page. First of all, the STEBA program, perhaps uh, some of you or your, your kids perhaps already attended the STEBA program, that's very academic program, mostly summer and we try to improve the academic skill, mostly focused on math and English. However, to boost the math and English, we try to incorporate uh, other social um, emotional learning, including dancing and taekwondo and other things as well. Uh, next, 
Mm. So uh, we proudly we proudly make a big difference in many, you know through the sun. This is actually the last summer's uh, uh, result. <coughs> uh, red one is before program and uh, purple is after program. Um, the step up program theme is um, I'm a genius. Well, more exactly saying I'm a potential genius. But anyway, they deserve that because uh, within uh, four, five weeks only, uh, actually they made a big difference. Uh, next. So all, all, all grades, even some big, some, some grades big, some grades small. Next. Mm. Because time constraint, I'm really very quickly, quickly, yeah. Uh, uh, that that file may be there available to you, but I don't want to take the time that long, so uh, show only just the students uh, speaking, because students speaking should be more powerful or more uh, informative than my speaking. Who do I think is a genius? Yes. Warren Buffett. Uh, Tom Brady. Sandy the YouTuber is a genius because he usually makes Minecraft videos, makes a ton of money, and goes in crazy adventures. Do you think you're a genius? Huh? Do you think you're a genius? No. So next, I think we don't have time. Uh, so, oh, no. after program. Do you think you're a genius? Duh. <laughs> 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 Next slide. Well, other students actually more explicitly say, yes, I'm genius. But I show that girl, which she seems to be shy, but positive. Uh, next slide. Uh, but we're actually trying to improve. One, two, one, two, three, four. Stabia. Okay. Well, this lily was created by students. Uh, not by us. <coughs> of course, song, you know, uh, created by our music teacher. But we try to improve not only academic skill, <coughs> excuse me, but also their uh, sense of community leadership, even though they uh, seems to be, you know, the um, just child. But I think uh, they have uh, ability to change their community as well. So next is also, you know, how they can support one, even two, mayor's one, two, initiative three, clean. Oh, no, 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 no. Next slide. Next, 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 next. Sorry. Next slide. Was building on the lecture versus coming daily under pressure. Working on the plot and the scheme, the true stock trade walk is at the edge of your dreams. I'm talking one, one shot for the kill. The breeze cut freeze up, straight drop in the chills. I'm talking taking over pieces and shares of all big sky high. Check the move on the final, move on the final because everything needs to be cool. And the ro the roof didn't smell bad, but it was all it was all right. Now it smells good because of the Lysol wipes. It was perfect, guys. We did it. We did Whoa. it. Now it smells. I mean, before it smelled all right, now it smells good. All right, done. So that's that's why that's what is you know kind of output uh, the relationship between us and the uh, Brockton Public School. Absolutely, we don't say that uh, everything is not credited to uh, EDR only, but actually the strong partnership and collaboration with uh, Brockton Public Schools and uh, particularly staffs and the teachers who worked with us, absolutely they also uh, highly credited for that type of uh, student's uh, achievement as well. So anyway, you know, I'm trying to um, 
introduce you know the your children's achievements, a sense of leadership, how they may change themselves. Uh, of course, we long way to go because we cannot serve thousand students uh, yet. We actually served uh, every year, you know, 120 or 150, depending on the budget size. Uh, sometimes 300, you know, if we have more money. Uh, but so far, I think uh, six or 700 students were served uh, through uh, step up. Also, this past binder, maybe because of time, I cannot uh, show you know again uh, this one. I will gonna you know release this one to everybody. But this is actually high school students uh, to uh, maybe 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 just briefly maybe thirty seconds. Uh, can you show that? Um, video only, a little bit. Yeah, maybe that. Mm. Only students, students testimony. I don't, I don't want to take the time. My name is Andrea Dravelares. I want to, I want to become a doctor, uh, OBGYN. So, in doing this program, I'm trying to learn a little bit more. I'm trying to do my best. So. Yeah, this is important. Dr. Lays is my favorite because I, when I hear him, I get more, more emotion, more excited about the career. And he say everybody can do it. That's it, okay. Uh, stop, stop, stop. So just like that, uh, elementary, middle school, and high school students, high school students, we don't teach math and English, but we really try to let them understand what is a, uh, their future opportunity in professional and uh, the fast growing industry opportunity and how that's why they need to prepare, work hard to attend the college. Uh, and we're helping them to prepare the essay or application, even scholarship. Uh, that's actually what we have done. Uh, thanks to the mayor's uh, uh, support, very strong support, uh, you know, we actually were able to continue this high school students program and uh, so far, great. So I appreciate uh, really uh, Mayor Sullivan and everybody here for supporting and allowing us to continue uh, this meaningful uh, social project with uh, Brockton. So we, are, uh, we try to bring this Brockton stories you know, to uh, basically international conference you know, held in Korea. Maybe a, a lot um, international leaders also attend. So, uh, you know, not only my speech, but also I'm trying to bring three model students as well. You know, really let them engage, you know, the other people and really proudly, proudly introduce, you know, their hometown, you know, to, to others. That's the main purpose of the trip. That is scheduled May uh, 18 to May 26, and then the detail is already, you know, distributed to you also. So, uh, welcome any questions uh, to you. Uh, you know, okay. Members of the committee, I just want to let you know, uh, first opportunity I had to meet Dr. Jang was when COVID came to Brockton. Uh, we actually didn't even have our first death yet in the city of Brockton, and we're at 543 as we sit here tonight. He came here with a woman named Linda Champion and Linda's mom and dad, and they donated masks, homemade masks, to try to help Brocktonians. He doesn't live in Brockton, but he cares about Brockton. He's also fostered a relationship with my office and the Consul General of Korea. Uh, the Step Up program has been phenomenal. So I want to thank you, Doctor, what you've done for Brockton and what you continue to do for Brockton. Are there any questions for Dr. Jang at this time? Mr. Rodriguez, please. Thank you for your presentation. Is it possible for you to email that presentation so I could take a deeper? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. That, I, if nobody has any questions, I move to uh, motion to approve okay. uh, Brock the Students Korean Trip okay. um, Asian Leadership Conference with the United Nations Command. I will. I second that. Motion made was properly second. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Oh, one, one, one thing I forgot. Uh, we were requested to select the two students, you know, from, you know, maybe the kind of former program students, but possibly other students too. But also, one specific is actually the if anyone 
uh, child of U.S. Uh, forces, you know, basically the U.S. soldiers serving in Korea right now, you know, Destons will be, you know, really top priority as well. So I think uh, if you know, you know, any Brockton residents, but uh, their parents are serving in Korea right now as a military personnel, please, you know, really let them up, up, you know, make, uh, uh, apply to this program. We'll, we'll really treat them pretty specially. If there is no one, you know, uh, the current active members, uh, military members' uh, descendants, then I think uh, we might also consider some maybe grandchild of uh, Korean War veterans as well. But again, the organizer specifically requested, uh, you know, to select the US, you know, the U.S. soldiers, uh, U.S. So soldiers, officers, whoever, their, their child, uh, you know, just we're gonna bring. Probably secret, you know, really without, without telling their parents in advance, okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, have a good evening. Thank you, sir. Dr. Cobbs. Thank you, Dr. J. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a student representative report for Anthony Vega of Rockland High School. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cobbs, Mayor Sullivan, members of the committee, and everyone else that's here. Uh, uh, my role at Brockton High is to... Anthony, one second. Um, if we could just check, I was just texted, no one can hear us uh, outside of this place. Could we just check the, the, the mute button? Uh, someone just texted me and said they're trying to watch this and it's completely muted. Sorry about that, Anthony. Thank you. Good, thank you very much. Anthony, the floor is yours, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, again, thank you everyone. My role here is to highlight the positives and also uh, bring forth the attention of negatives that happen uh, at BHS. So first I wanna start off by um, introducing our uh, class officer, our class treasurer, Olivia Rapuya, who would like to share some information with you guys. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Olivia Rapuya, and I'm the senior class treasurer. I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. It's a great opportunity for, um, for me to just speak on the behalf of everyone. So uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, since I'm the only officer out of the four, um, they were not able to make it here tonight, but that is not why I'm here. The big reason why I'm here tonight is to talk about the big fundraiser that we are holding for the senior class. Nobody here needs to hear me talk about the financial situation we're in because we all know what that's about. The seniors of Brockton High are trying our absolute hardest to put together a fundraiser to help alleviate the cost of our senior prom. We know that our prom is going to be held at Gillette Stadium on May 23rd and everyone including myself are really looking forward to it. We acknowledge that prom isn't a cheap event and if people want to attend, they need to pay for it. To make prom accessible to everyone, we are holding a fundraiser to help reduce the cost of prom tickets. We want to make sure that everyone has a chance to attend prom and that they can still go despite any financial situations that they are experiencing. Our fundraiser idea is a lot of fun and it can get a lot of you involved too. It is a raffle for every day in March being themed around the pot of gold that is often tied with St. Patrick's Day. We want to make sure that every day of this raffle is special, like finding gold at the end of a rainbow. The main idea is that we will sell a calendar that lists all the different prizes you can possibly win during the month of March. The calendar, the purchase of a calendar comes with a raffle ticket where you could possibly win one of the prizes that are listed within the month of March. They aren't expensive, they're $10. I know that you guys could drop like a week of Duncan. I know you guys can. <laughs> By buying a calendar, your name will be placed into the raffle where you could possibly win. And I know you guys all like winning something. I know people like fantasy football, so you guys have no excuse. However, in order to win a prize, we need prizes, which is why we're calling on to you guys to help us get like prizes within our calendar. 
So far, we've received donations of various things to raffle off, things like gift cards to different re restaurants, which were kindly donated from restaurants like Khalil's Kitchen and Birdie's Hot Kitchen, and even the lodge in Randolph. We even got a donation from our own senior advisor, Mr. Brophy, who isn't here because, in his words, he sucks. And, <laughs> but he was kind enough to donate a sweatshirt from his gracious golf team. So send Mr. Brophy a thanks. We also got a donation, as I mentioned, from the lodge from a very good student of ours, Tamia Marshall, which we are very thankful for. Unfortunately, we do not have enough donations for each day in the month of March, and we are hoping for some help from the public and other local businesses. What we're looking for isn't like elaborate. We're looking for gift cards of any kind or any gift certificates to any establishment so we can still help raise um, awareness of like the existence of these Brockton owned businesses. This is a great opportunity to get involved with the community and get your business recognized if you want to help us out with our fundraiser. There are a lot of businesses here in Brockton, some we may not even know, but if you know a person, spread the word. For example, a law firm that someone you may know who owns could donate a pair of headphones as a prize or someone could even donate a $10 Amazon gift card. No donation is too small and no donation goes underappreciated. All donations will be on the calendar with the business name, and when the daily winners are announced, it will be renamed as well. Any donation would be a step closer to a student being able to attend prom. To a, um, I know you're here because you want to see reform and change, but by supporting this fundraiser, it's a positive impact you can leave on the senior class and classes to follow. Thank you for giving me the space and the stage to say what I want to say, and I appreciate everything you guys do, and I hope to see you all here. Um, if you want to hear more about the BHS senior class, you can follow us here at BHS underscore CO24. And if you have any further questions or inquiries about the calendar, you can message David Brophy at bpsma.org or Nancy Tucker at bpsma.org. Thank you and have a fantastic evening. Quick, quick question. If someone wanted to donate gift cards, would they just put Mr. Brophy's name and drop it off at administration or the front desk or the principal's office? Or You can put um, Ms. Tucker. Okay. And or, and or either. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Azak, so, please. Thank you so much. Um, you forgot a really nice donation that was personally donated by four of us. Oh, is it on there? Yes, it's oh. it's there. It's just in really tiny font. Oh, it's okay. So um, this is out of our own pockets. Has nothing to do with the school committee money. But Mr. Rodriguez came up with a great idea while we were there, and um, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Gomes, and Mrs. Oliver and myself um, donated a television, a flat screen TV. So yeah. let's anyone honestly, I love this. This is a great money maker. A lot of our schools do these calendars, so if you have hair salons, nail salons, restaurants, oil changes, like she said, anything to just help them out to defer the cost of the prom. And I think when we sat in on the senior uh, assembly, it's around $60,000. So, you know, if they sell 600 calendars, this can help them with their prom, even if they sell a few hundred calendars. Um, so I'll buy 10. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, anything else? Also, thank you so much for that donation. I, we really appreciate it. I think the, uh, the mayor should donate uh, a raffle uh, somebody could win and be the mayor for the day. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll buy a couple tickets for that one. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> we'll definitely be in touch. All right. Thank you so much. Well, more than a day, Tony. <laughs> uh, thank you to Olivia for telling all of us about the uh, the fundraiser. Accidentally forgetting to mention the TV donated, and it's okay. definitely Mr. Brophy's words on how much of an awful person he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, on, on with the presentation. Uh, first, I'm going to start out by congratulating the BHS concert once again. I feel like I do this every single time I'm here. Uh, the concert band, advanced concert band, uh, repertory chorus, and concert choir performed spectacularly as they always do. They managed to just top their like their last performance every time, and um, 
I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you to all those who, uh, who attended and all those who performed. And then going on to the AP Scholars, BHS got, to, uh, got together to recognize and congratulate 20 current and former students that were chosen by College Board as AP Scholars. These exemplary students were presented with certificates handed out by Dr. Cobbs, Mr. Duarte, Mr. Erickson, uh, Ms. Ms. Baker, and others. So congratulations to those students for their academic excellence. And then the sad transition um, from Mr. Duarte to Mr. McCaskill. Uh, so, so. Uh, from personal experiences with Mr. McCaskill, the new principal, everyone loves him. Um, he just brings a new fun energy and he really, at least for me and a couple other students that I talked to, he really just brightens our day and makes us feel like we want to be at Brock and High just a little bit more. And to me, that makes the biggest difference. And it's also sad to see uh, Mr. Duarte uh, move on from us because we also loved him. And then going on to the honors assembly, uh, the BHS students who made the honor roll list were greeted with a celebration of their academic ex excellence. They got to enjoy an amazing performance from the band and were recognized for their academic achievements. And then congratulations to all the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship Ceremony receivers, um, which is yet another reminder of how stellar BHS kids are. 155 students were presented with the scholarship with our own Mayor Sullivan, Dr. Cobbs, Mr. McCaskill, Mr. Tony Rodriguez, Miss Anna Oliver, and I'm sure others that I didn't purposely leave out uh, were present. Along with the scholarship, Mr. Uh, Claudio Gomes gave such an awe-inspiring speech about what it means to persevere through the hardships of life. And I want to say congratulations to all the students and parents who attended. And then shortly after that, on January 23rd, the Brockton High chapter of the National Honor Society inducted their new members with a wonderful ceremony. The NHS program continues to highlight the countless students at BHS that want to make a difference in their community. And then I want to highlight um, someone from the Boxer Athletics. Congratulations to Armani Russo for committing to St. Vincent College for baseball. Armani's outstanding work ethic and perseverance allowed him to work his way towards this amazing opportunity. He embodies what a Brockton boxer looks like and everyone at BHS wishes him the best of luck in his next chapter of life. And then uh, the student feedback first, I wanna start with the positive notes. Uh, like I said before, the transition between Mr. Duarte and Mr. McCaskill, um, it's hard to see Mr. Duarte go as he was well loved by both staff and students. Mr. McCaskill is definitely filling that spot. Like I said, everyone loves him. He brightens all of our days. And then regarding the other aspects of BHS, there's a multitude of problems as people have uh, come up to the podium and mentioned before. Certain students are out of control and they aren't met with any repercussions. Uh, a couple of speakers today noted that it's just that small 10%, but that 10% um, does make a difference on our reputation as a school and as a community. Um, still students wandering throughout the day and they have no respect or concern for the staff or anyone with any uh, or any authorial figures. Um, teachers have come up and spoken at these meetings multiple times talking about how their safety and well-being are constantly violated. Uh, what I consider and many other students consider and teachers is that the absolute top priority should be the safety of students and staff and to create an enjoyable learning environment and everyone's talking about this isn't the BHS that I grew up with. We can't restore that, like the greatness of this school, which has so much to offer, so many courses, so many different opportunities for students that can take them far in life. We can't restore that greatness until these basic concerns of safety and creating a, uh, a good learning environment are dealt with. And there's, that's, uh, that should be our first course of action. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, members of the committee, any questions for Anthony? Uh, Ms. Ayers, please. Anthony, really quick, how much of the tickets to the prom do we know? I think, uh, as uh, like last I was last I heard, it was a hundred dollars per student without any fundraising stuff. Okay. What's up? And we base it on the number of kids that typically arrive or typically come, and then divided by the price of last year. Like we tried to figure out last year's bill was. So we go 
go with that. Last year, our original price was 80, and we were told to lower it. Um, so um, we were directed to cut the price in half to 40, and that it would be met up from another body. And um, that has led to the dire straits of this year's senior class. Our, the deposit has already been paid, so that part is handled. Um, but right now, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood between 80 and and $100 if we don't raise the funds. But if every student sells 10 tickets, that lowers the price by $10 for everybody. Well, and I was thinking that if you're looking for ideas um, for the calendar, purchase a couple of prom tickets. Like, you know, like this day, you know, so that, you know, I know I'm being traditional saying this, but a boy asks a girl and he can buy two tickets because he won it off the raffle. Like, if anybody's looking for Absolutely. ideas, purchase a couple of tickets so a couple can go to the prom as well. So I figured I'd ask how much the tickets are. And the other thing I wanted to ask is do we know how much the yearbooks are going to be this year? I am not affiliated with the yearbook. Um, there are two yearbook advisors that those questions could be directed to. That's Jamie Boyd okay. and Sue Ann Navarro. Okay. Thank you very Welcome. much. Thank you. Any, uh, any additional questions for, for Anthony? Again, Anthony, thank you very much for always doing a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Dr. Cobbs? Thank you, Anthony. Great presentation. Much appreciated. Good luck with your senior prom. So, so the next item on the agenda is the presentations from the schools. Um, the first one we have is the Mary Baker Elementary School. Um, we'll have Dr. Dr. Spalding um, introduce the team. Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you, as always, um, for the opportunity to share the amazing work that is happening in the Brockton Public Schools. Um, before I hand the microphone over to the Baker School, um, we heard many folks this evening speak with incredible pride about their experiences at Brockton High. And I just want to talk for a moment to the class of 2037. Because tomorrow night, we have the Kindergarten Information Showcase. And so I want to make sure that all of our members of the class of 2037, you're probably four right now, listening at home, I'm sure. Um, but if you will be five on or before August 31st, we can't wait to welcome you as our incoming class of kindergartners. So we hope that um, parents and guardians will be able to attend at 6 p.m. at the Arnone School tomorrow. You can enter in the cafeteria. Um, we do encourage you to bring your member of the class of 2037 with you. Uh, we do have a special activity planned for those uh, incoming students and so that we can have a little bit of time with the grown-ups to brag about all the amazing things that are happening in kindergarten and what they can look forward to. So we do hope to see you uh, tomorrow at the Arnone at 6 p.m. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you the leadership team of the Baker School. That is Principal Brower and Assistant Principal Donovan. Thank you. Everyone. My name is Valerie Brower. I'm the principal of the Baker School. George Donovan, the assistant principal of the Baker School. And we're excited to be able to showcase a lot of the excellent things that are going on at the Baker School. As you can see on our slide, we have a big school of about 730 kids. We have 30 gen ed classrooms, six large classrooms, and eight sub separate classrooms. We are really proud of the diverse community that we have at the Baker School. At the Baker, we all belong is not just a phrase, it's what we live every day. Many of, you who, many of you in the room attended our Baker School <coughs> celebration at the end of last year. The Baker School celebration was an idea born out of the Baker School staff's commitment to the continued promotion of diversity and inclusion. Working on an overarching theme around Mary E. Baker and celebrating her and who we are, teachers worked with their grade level team to create a project-based learning experience or research project for their students. The projects 
were multicultural, inclusive, and stretched our students' thinking and knowledge. Students worked on their research and projects throughout the spring over several days and weeks. Each grade level presented their product, research, or performance at our Baker celebration. This work continues today. All of our students are integrated during the day, during lunch, recess, and specialists. We have a main focus uh, to have a high percentage of students that are integrated in academic areas in our general ed classrooms. At the Baker School, we actively work to create and maintain an environment in which students' diverse backgrounds, identities, strengths, and challenges are respected. Based on our diverse population, we understand that a solid foundation of inclusivity for all is a basis for our success in all areas. At this time, I'd like to highlight our vocal data. This is how the state measures climate and learning in the schools. Students in grade four and five rate their school in four categories, and this is done at the end of the MCAS testing. Where they, are, they rate us on climate, engagement, safety, and environment. I'm extremely proud to highlight that the Baker School is number one in, in climate, engagement, and safety in the elementary schools and tied for number one in environment. And we are substantially higher than the state in all areas. This speaks to how our students view the school and how they feel safe and supported within the Baker School. And this is a real sense of pride for us. We're proud of the growth in the fall. We are, we're proud of many things, but the three things that we decided to talk about tonight were um, significant improvement on MCAS accountability system. As you know, the state sets targets through the MCAS accountability system to determine what it takes for students to make gains. Currently, the Baker is classified as substantial progress toward all targets. 54% of our students met their targets. Our lowest performing students met 67% of their targets. We exceeded our target for all students in math. In ELA and math, we have been on the high side of growth since the pandemic. We're higher than the state average. Uh, yeah, excuse me. To add on to that, our, uh, our STAR data also shows growth, growth, and this is our best indicator of future success on MCAS. In STAR math, we went from 44% of students in the red in the fall to 38 in the winter. In STAR reading, we went from 44% of students in the red in the fall to 37% in the winter. This data, shows us, this data shows us that our commitment and focus on wonders, the science of reading, illustrative math, and the work we have done with EDI and inclusivity is creating the foundation and framework for student success at the Baker. As far as the areas that we're working to continue to address, we're struggling to provide appropriate supports for our youngest newcomers. While we have a social emotional curriculum, Every room has a peaceful place. We have a mindful room. We see a lot of big feelings, so we are constantly looking for ways to support these students as they acclimate to school. Our attendance has been fairly consistent, but we have struggled with tardies. We strive to make connections with families, build relationships, and approach the students and families with supports. We're able to say a lot of great things about the data, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say that we certainly need additional supports. Additional supports with tier two and tier three as far as not just behaviors, but academics, small group instruction. We need more. We have a feel good story, something that happened at the Baker School this week that was a little bit unexpected. We received a phone call early one morning and a dad who had been away for 13 months asked if he could come in and surprise his daughter. He wasn't able to get to her before school started. So um, with the help of Mark from the Enterprise, who was there very quickly, we were able to make something very um, special happen. So we have a video of that. Oh, 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 so would you mind if we interrupted with us? We have a special guest. Oh, I would be happy to be interrupted. Does anyone mind if we have a special guest come in? Yes. Yes. Oh, no. Yes. I mean, yes. 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 Yes.
A snapshot into the Baker School. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? How do you follow that? Ne next. <laughs> it's Dr. a good thing Michelle I have Connors, such a heart of stone. I think I'd be in tears right now. I was able to quickly to wipe them up. Thank you so much to the Baker family and community. Mm -hmm. What an amazing story. Um, so I'm here tonight to introduce our leadership team from Plouffe Middle School. We have Principal Ahern, Assistant Principal Westcott, and Associate Principal um, Jamie Esty to share their story tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Sullivan, Dr. Cobbs, school community members, and of course, the cabinet members. It is great pride uh, that I get to highlight the Joseph Plouffe Middle School. I'm Shauna Hearn, I'm the principal of the school. This is my first year at Plouffe, and I'm proud to continue the legacy of Plouffe as I follow a great principal, Ms. Nazarella, who retired last year. And when I worked as a principal of North, I, uh, I worked closely with Ms. Nazarella. So tonight with me, I have Ms. Jamie Esty, uh, who's the associate principal. And uh, this is her first year at Plouffe as the associate. Um, she came over from West Middle School, but is no stranger to the Plouffe as she worked there as an IRS before her move to West. And then I have Mr. Eric Westcott, who is the assistant principal and is the only veteran administrator, and I am very thankful for that. So Plouffe has a total enrollment of 645 students, making it the largest middle school. We have the dual language programs in both Spanish and Portuguese. We have the bilingual continuum of TBE, SEI to ISEI. And the majority of our EL students are Spanish speakers. We also have SLD, ASD, and life skill programs at the school. And we are the Pluff Wolves, the leaders of the pack. So this picture here uh, represents um, a small community service project that uh, we had at the school this past fall, uh, and we called it Keep Pluff Pretty. Um, it was spearheaded by our guidance counselor, Dr. McDonald, and we asked students to come to the school and help, and we offered a barbecue uh, lunch as a reward to come uh, clean up the grounds around the school, and we figured there'd be about 50 to 60 students. It was the fall. Um, well, that day, the weather um, was just gorgeous. It was one of the most uh, beautiful days of the fall, and we ended up having over 150 students attend um, and in fact, we had to go purchase more food uh, because we didn't have enough. I think we ran down to Shaw's, oh, Instacart. Oh yeah, we Instacarted that. Um, I mean, the, the, it was a robust turnout. It was amazing. And uh, this just re represents the Pluff School spirit. Um, we, we couldn't even fit all the kids in the picture. We, yeah, there's more. We, we should have panoramic, I think that's what they call it. All right, so things we're proud of uh, at Pluff. Uh, so number one, our TNTP progress monitoring visits. Um, at our latest ELA TNTP progress monitoring visit, PLUF ELA and ESL teachers scored 100% across the board in core action number one, which attends to grade level rigorous text at the center of all lessons. The district goal was to be at 90% in this area by May of 24. And so we achieved that goal in December of 23. At the latest TNTP math progress monitoring visit, PLUF math teachers scored 
100% in core action number one. Again, attends to the grade level standards, rigor, and connecting mathematical concepts being at the core of the lesson. Both teachers have high standards for student learning. Our star data growth. In star math between fall and winter assessments, we saw an 8.6% drop in students not meeting expectations, which is great. And that low category, we want to see negative as we're moving students up. We had a 4.8% growth in partially meeting, a 1.8% growth in meeting, and a 2% growth in exceeding. And we had students who moved two categories. In our star reading assessment, we had similar growth, a drop of 8.8% not meeting, an increase in 2.3% for partially meeting, a 4.7% growth in meeting, and a 1.8% growth in exceeding. And for our students with disabilities in math, we saw a 9% drop in not meeting and moved those students to partially meeting, meeting, and exceeding. And ELA, students with disabilities, we didn't have the same results, but we did move almost 5% out of the not meeting expectation. On January 16th of this year, we had a DESE walkthrough. The walkthrough had a number of objectives, and we received initial feedback on school-wide instructional observations. There is work to be done in all domains that were observed and scored but PLUF scored high in positive climate relationships, productivity, and student engagement. And this doesn't happen by accident. This is a direct result of our dedicated staff. We have many areas that we want to improve to boost academic achievement for our students. We look critically at our data and our neediest students. Three areas we are looking to improve. First, access testing, which is testing students on English proficiency for our English language learners. This year, we have tested 244 students. That is 39% of our school population. The bilingual office has been great in supporting us at PLUF. With the help of Ms. Nina West, we have worked with students to create individual student WIDA goals. In years past, teachers created the goals. We thought it would be beneficial to have conversations with students so they had voice in their own learning goals. Ms. West also developed lessons for students about access testing, creating opportunities for students to practice speaking. We noted that this is a part of the test that students typically struggle with, even our highest English language learners. She met with our EL teachers during common planning time to discuss the importance of access and how they can encourage students to do their best work. We want accurate measurement of students' academic English language proficiency to gauge whether a child is attaining English proficiency and or when a child can ex ex exit the EL program. In an effort to increase academic achievement with our students with disabilities, we want to make sure students are getting access to the most rigorous standards and instructional strategies. Ms. Esty has been working with Ms. Danielle Wynn and Ms. Ginny Lundstedt on developing schedules for our students with disabilities, especially our SLD students, so that they're put in front of certified core content teachers as much as possible while still providing all of the service deliveries. They will continue this work as they look to begin scheduling for the 2024-25 school year. And finally, as our numbers indicate, our English language learners are the biggest growing population for PLUF. We began the year with only two of our EL teachers returning from last year. Eight of our nine current EL teachers are on emergency licensure, and they are wonderful, and they are working hard, and they're doing the best they can for our students. They're doing amazing work. We have not been able to fill our Spanish speaking guidance council position due to a lack of candidates. We have been working with the bilingual department and they have been amazing supporting us, the teachers and our students. Thank you, Kelly Jones and Jen Hunter, you're amazing. And currently we have 47 grade six TBE students. I don't know why, but it seems every new student that comes in is a sixth grader. 
and that is putting a lot of stress on our schedules and we're not able to spread them out. We were able to hire another teacher in December for ESL, but all of a sudden that 47 snuck up on us and now we have a math class with 47 students. And these are our neediest students as they are newcomers in learning the English language. And yes, we are in the process of trying to hire an additional teacher to help with the influx. Our needs change as students come into the district. We know how hard it is to plan for us. We have to figure out how do we plan, schedule, and staff for February, March, and April, and so on, not for who we have as students in September. We know these numbers increase. So why do we come to work every day? We do it for the kids. Maria says that she likes coming to school to study new things and improve her abilities. If not us, then who? Again? <laughs> Again, I'd like to thank Dr. Cobbs, the cabinet, the teachers and students at the PLUF, and I thank you for all listening tonight. If you have any questions, you can ask now or reach out to us at any time. Questions at all, members of the committee? Thank you again. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Connors. Just here, I'm just the intermission. I'd um, like to introduce the leadership team from Promise College and Career Academy. We have doctors in the house, Dr. Silva, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Jansen. If I was a comedian, I'm sure there's some Dr. joke Dr. in there somewhere. Um, I pass it to you. <laughs> this is every short person's nightmare when they're presenting. Long. Good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Kelly Silva. I'm the proud principal of Promise College and Career Academy. Um, I have here tonight Dr. Abigail Jansen, who is our Associate Principal of Curriculum and Instruction, and Dr. Michael Robinson, who is our Instructional Resource Specialist. Um, Promise is in its second year of operation, um, and currently we have um, 96 students. Um, our specialized programs, we have an honors program, um, dual enrollment college classes, uh, an SEI program, and a special education program. So we have um, growth, proud of our growth in many areas. Oh, Nubi, you saw your picture up there? Okay. So last year, our students take biology in the ninth grade. Um, and last year, our current 10th graders, but our ninth graders, we had a 98% um, a um, success rate. So 98% of our students passed the science MCAS in biology. Um, last term, 20% of our students made honor roll, 38% made high honor roll, and 10% made highest honor roll. And these per percentages are great, but perhaps the most amazing part of this is the number of students that came up to us and said they've never made honor roll before. Um, we've seen um, gains in our sta star data from fall to winter. We saw a 4% increase in our meeting and exceeding um, population. And, reading and a 5% increase in meeting to exceeding in math. Currently, right now, 76% of our students have three or more college credits, and 20% of our students currently have 20, 12 college credits, and that's as a sophomore. And they're actually gonna be earning, th earning three more college credits this upcoming semester. We also have, as part of our model, our transformative learning experiences, and these are our project-based learning experiences that are a part of the design, part of the grant that we receive from the Bar Foundation, and what they are are project-based units that are rigorous, relevant, engaging, and they usually include a, um, an expert from the field that we're covering in the area, and 70% of our teachers are implementing these in classes, and our goal is to have 100% implementation. And probably the most significant um, percentage up there is when we asked all the students, you know, do you have a, um, a person in the building that you can go to or that you can trust? And 100% of the students said that they had at least one person in the building that they knew that was a go-to person. It didn't have to be 
actually it's usually not the principal, but it didn't have to be an administrator, it didn't have to be the, the adjustment counselor, it was the guidance counselor, it was our mentor, it was everybody in that building, and that's what I'm so proud of with our staff, because we have a bunch of go-to people. Um, some areas that we are working to address. Um, one is attendance, and there are many reasons for student attendance, and everybody knows that when COVID happened, attendance took a, took a dip. But I think one of our, um, what we discovered is a lot of our students are struggling with attendance in high school and how it impacts your grades, especially if you're taking the college classes. We don't design the requirements of the college classes, and there usually is an attendance requirement. So. While we're struggling in this area, we are working to address it. We have a team, Dr. Robinson, myself, the school adjustment counselor, Ms. Jackson, Ms. Jacobs, the guidance counselor. We're calling parents. We're working with um, the attendance officers. We're doing a, everything we can to support kids because there's a reason why kids aren't coming to school, and we want to make sure that they are coming to school. But if there's something that they need support with, if, they need, um, if the family needs support, we want to make sure that we address that. Um, while we have a small student population, we only have six core content teachers. That's six core content teachers to cover core content classes, electives and enrichment classes, um, also partner teacher for the college classes. We have a specialist that comes once a week for four days, so it's a lot of coverage. Um, and we have been very strategic in using administrators, using the building sub, using the school adjustment council, the guidance council, everybody has been working together so we can cover these things, but it is, has been a challenge to have only six core content teachers. And another um, is the continuity and adherence to the PROMISE model. Um, we got a, a grant from the Bar Foundation several years ago to design the school. And now that we're in the implementation phase, you know, there are things that need to be tweaked, but there's also some additions that need to be made. We have the college classes, but we need more. Um, and we want to look at the, the career piece, too, because, you know, kids might not want to go to college, but they, and they want, we need to focus on the career piece. So we are looking at opportunities. I'm working with Dr. Boone. I'm working with Dr. Ferreira on different things. But... One of the challenges with the continuity is when the staff changes. All of our staff is required to go to certain um, PD, certain trainings, and so we lost two key members of our staff this year. Um, and while we got a bunch of people that were willing to, to get the PD, it kind of, we had to move back to move forward. And also, the, like I said, the college and career opportunities, and we're working on that. And as I mentioned, we were fortunate to get the bar grant again this year that's really going to support us with this. And um, I just, if you have any ideas, if you know of any people, we're really looking for the career piece. We're really looking for different ideas. Um, we've reached out to area colleges. Even if you know of any colleges that want to do some partnerships, we're really looking for those ideas. So if you know anybody, that would be great. So why we come to work every day, um, and I took some quotes from some students. It's funny with the pictures, too, because I went around and I showed the kids, and they're like, oh, God, please don't show this picture. But I, <laughs> our kids are so beautiful, and the girl on the video that said, duh, she's one of our students. So, <laughs> yeah, shout out to Erie. Um, by the end of the ninth grade, I will already have college credits and know how college classes work. I will have the upper hand on ninth graders in other schools. I like how the teachers interact with us and help us with things outside of academics. The teachers at Promise don't give up on us when we're not doing our best. They're always pushing us to become better students and more successful. Uh, and this is from a, um, a family member. My brother was always a shy kid and my parents were worried about him fitting in. A couple months ago, we came for a parent conference and they told us he was opening up and finding his place in the classroom. This school has given him the opportunity to be himself and open up to new experiences. And from a staff member, I love coming to work every day because Promise is my family. And that's what I will say about this school. I've been in the district for 24 years. Um, I was started off at South. I was at East as an instructional resource specialist. I was an associate principal. I went back to East as a principal. But one thing about any school that I've been at, it's family. You have to operate like family. And I tell the kids all the time, I'm gonna be like your mother, you're gonna like it. 20% of the time and hate it 80% of the time, but, but because we care and our staff cares and we have a bunch of people around 
um, students in this district that really, really care about them. So, um, I also have some promised T-shirts. Um, one T-shirt fell out of the bag, and I don't know whose it is, so I'm going to give them to, um, uh, um, sorry, Melinda, but I, I didn't want to call by her first name. <laughs> Miss Campbell, sorry, I want to give them to Miss Campbell, and um, she'll let me know which one fell out of the bag. Any questions? Thank you very much. Mrs. Sullivan, please. Yep. So applications, we're going to open the applications up probably at the end of March, maybe the mid to end of March. So the students apply online, and then they, they do interviews, and then they usually hear um, a month before school gets out. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Gomes, please. Well, thank you for the presentation. Um, it's, it's always good to see something like this. I did take um, some of these courses, not with you guys, when I was in high school, and I did get college credit for it, so it was wonderful. Uh, and you get the experience as well. Uh, my question is, what's your capacity? So right now, we're at the Summer Street building. Uh -huh. um, I think with capacity, you just have to be strategic. Um, our hope is that some of our students will be doing um, the early college program. <laughs> so if you have, if we, you know, like next year, we're going to take about 50 more students. And when we add on, but if a certain number are in the early college program, that's a no certain number of students that aren't in the building at the time. So it's... There's so many different and moving pieces to promise, so I can't really say like this number will fit in the building because this number might not be in the building at that time. The enrollment might be there, so um, it all depends on where we are with you know certain programs like the early college program. Thank you, Mr. Gomes. Any additional, uh, Ms. Ailers, please. Um, Dr. Silva, I would love to reach out to you. I've worked in higher ed for over 30 years, and so I think we might be able to coordinate some synergies that might work. So I'll reach out to you over the next couple of days if you're open to that. That would be great. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Ms. Azak, please. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Silva. And um, I just wanted to thank you. I, I had an opportunity since you recently moved to the Summer Street location to stop by. I was dropping some, some coats off. So I spent um, some time over there with Miss Jackson, who gave me a tour. Um, I'd been in the building before, but not since Promise had, had been relocated there. Um, so thank you for taking time to show me um, the facility. And Miss Jackson, those that haven't seen it, stop by. It's, it's wonderful. It's a great program. And getting the college credits is a step up. It helps our students be, be ahead of the game. Um, and that, that's going to be a money saver for a lot of students that, you know, financially can't afford to go to a four-year. At least I'll have some, some college credits that'll offset some of the expenses and, and get them into that two-year degree. But thank you so much for taking time that day. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Uh, Rodriguez, please. Thank you. I know I know the answers to all this because you're in my district, but can you just elaborate on what the Bar Foundation um, supports with those grants and how much money that the uh, promise is actually taken in and what we can expect in the future as far as the Bar Foundation supporting the promise. For those that don't know um, what these funds are actually being used for. Um, in the past, and I recently wrote uh, a grant for the Bar Foundation and we were awarded um, $500,000 over the next two years. Um, it supports staffing. Um, in the past, it support, supported different staff members. Um, we, we have a a mentor, um, it supports other staff members, it supports professional development, it, per, it um, supports learning opportunities for students that they might not get, it supports resources, um, materials, um, a lot of different things in a lot of different categories. Um, but I think one of the key things is staffing um, because, and we all know what the budget is like, but even to know that they're supporting us. I mean, they, they could have easily said, you know what, we're, you know, we're done with this school, but they've supported us for so long because they believe in what we're doing and to know that we're gonna get $500,000 to support our school and do great things for the kids. 
um, and they are with us every step of the way. Dr. Cobbs ha um, is on those meetings every month and things like that. Thank you. Uh, I know it's at 500,000, but is there uh, an increase from 500,000 to a million? Um, what other aspects do they, do they support the school? I know um, probably over when it was implemented, there was some mechanism in the grants where they will support the structure of the, of the buildings. It, it, it may, no, it, not I, with this I grant. No, one? and the, the 500,000 was the max for the next, max. over the next, over the course of the next two years. So there's no, there's no increase down the road. No, not that I know of. I mean, yeah. I'm always willing to write another grant. All right, keep those <laughs> grants coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Mr. Sullivan. Yes, thank you. Nice presentation. Thank you. You had mentioned in your uh, statements that you have six core teachers. It's not enough. How many do you actually need? Right now, to cover the classes. Um, we would need at least two additional core teachers, but when we add on certain students next year, I think we might need maybe three core teachers and a specialist teacher full-time would help. But I can make it work for that. Like, we're very strategic in what we, 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 what we work with. Um, but yeah. It's just because we offer, like, the college classes, you have to have a teacher with that person. Right. And so, you know, if a kid doesn't do well in the college class and he's withdrawn, I have to find a place to put that student. You know, if we have gym one day a week, so it's where, where do the other kids go? So, but the, I have to say this too, my staff is phenomenal. Whatever is thrown at us, my staff will, is, will always put all hands on deck and do whatever they can. So I just like to publicly thank them um, for, for being that, that way. Just to clear, you, you need two more teachers? Is that, two more core teachers? To support next year, probably about three more core teachers to Thank you. Thanks. Follow up for Mr. Rodriguez, please. I, I, I have one more uh, request, Dr. Cobbs. Uh, we need to change that sign in front of the building because it still says the champion out there. So if we can uh, make it happen. Uh, so it has a nice sign that says the Palmas High School. So people don't get confused. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Any additional uh, questions at this time? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Okay, the next item of business is an introduction of our interim school business administrator, uh, Mrs. Patricia Boyer. Um, I just want to say a couple of things to make her blush a little bit, but I have her resume here. It's about four pages long. <laughs> I won't go through everything on it, just to highlight. Uh, uh, Mrs. Boyer is, holds a, master, a valid uh, business administrator license from DESE. Um, she's a member of the school building committees on the two different districts that work with the MSBA to construct new school buildings. Um, she's a certified public uh, purchasing officer, which basically procurement, and it's a quite a arduous course to go through with the state to complete that training. Um, she's awarded for Tyler Technologies in Munis. Actually, uh, Mrs. Boyer worked for Brockton Public Schools years ago and was actually instrumental in implementing the Munich system for the Brockton Public Schools, so she's well versed in that. Um, she's a Master of Education in Educational Leadership, um, Bachelor of Science in Financial Accounting, and she's worked for the Holbrook Public Schools, which she recently retired from, Malden Public Schools, East Bridgewater Public Schools, Mastery Public Schools, and Brockton Public Schools. This is Patricia Boyer. Which we call, we call her Trish. Right? That's Trish. correct, yes. And she's a Brocktonian. Her house is right behind the scoreboard up here <laughs> on, on the field. That's all right. I get to see all the football games for free and the high school graduations, which I love. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Mayor, Superintendent, school committee members, and guests. My name is Patricia Boyer, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to serve the Brockton Public Schools in guiding the FY24 financial decisions. I bring to you 30 years of school finance experience and before that, 10 years in corporate accounting. I have lived in Brockton since 1989 after moving here from Connecticut. I hold two licenses from DESE, one as a school business official and the other as an administrator. These licenses are attained are only attained after rigorous training and experience 
and must be maintained by participating in a number of professional, de professional development hours per year. I have been an active member of MASBO since 2007. This is the statewide professional organization for Massachusetts school business officials. Each state has a similar organization and we all operate under the umbrella of ASBO, the Association of School Business Officials International. In addition to the hundreds of hours of PD opportunities each year, MASBO also offers a DESE approved school business official training program. While serving as a board member for MASBO from 2017 to 2020, I was chosen to teach a school finance course to a cohort of 22 students going through the MASBO training program, and I still act as an active mentor to this day. I bring my ex extensive experience, and since January have been in the trenches at the Brockton Public Schools working with the Open Architects team led by TJ Plant and our own finance team guiding the FY24 budget and grant processes. We strategize and maneuver every financial decision as a team. While we understand the urgencies for immediate answers, we are working diligently through hundreds of budget line items, many ongoing projects, and dozens of grants to ensure a thorough and proper accounting. I want to thank everyone at the school department and the city finance, legal, and procurement offices for being extremely helpful as we handle each task. And thank you for allowing me to be on board as we carefully navigate the FY24 and FY25 budgets. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boyer. Uh, any, any questions at this time? I know Mr. Plant is uh, a couple down, and I know you're going to be working on that as well. Yes. Um, Next agenda item, I guess, on unpaid bills. Right, the next agenda item is the unpaid bills from prior years, uh, fiscal year 23. Um, if you, Chris, are you doing this one, or are we, is TJ? Unpaid bills. Oh, unpaid bills. Mm -hmm. but, um, so what is presented to you is uh, the FY23 bills that have come up recently. Um, we believe this to be the last of the FY23 bills. Uh, so we'd like your approval in getting those paid. Uh, Ms. Ehlers, please. Patricia, sorry. Could you give us a little bit more detail in terms of the amount? Um, do you know where they're coming from? Like um, how, how much of the unpaid bills? And are they coming from one particular vendor or more than one? Just Sure. I don't have the list in front of me, but I did see it this past week. And if I, as I recall, there were three special ed tuition invoices that had come through. Thank you. This is so tiny, I need my glasses <laughs> for this. So there were three special ed tuition invoices that had come through. There were uh, some workers comp invoices that had come in very late. And uh, there were a number of small invoices from Securus Technology. And the reason why those came in so late was because uh, they had, Securus Technology had bought out Stanley Security. And in the transition of, of changing from one company to another, their billing got, um, got messed up. So it's not that we forgot these bills or misplaced them or anything. It's that they came in late from the vendors. And that's typically what happens, late bills. So just to follow, I'm sorry, just to follow up on your, like where you say it, um, they came in late from the vendors. Yes. Um, were, were you expecting them? As far as I know, no. Okay, so I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, I know that you, I know that you're working diligently in terms of, and like you said, hundreds of accounts, line items to straighten this out. In the future, would we know ahead of time that there's X amount of dollars that are still outstanding and that need to be paid? I, I guess that's what I'm like, we didn't know that we didn't know and now it's coming in. And so that's what I want to clarify is that 
you know, to approve to pay these bills, yes, I, I totally understand, but do we have reassurances that at a later time would be saying, okay, if Securitas or whatever, we, you know, we spent this money, why haven't we gotten an invoice from them? Right, exactly. So in my practice, it uh, what we've always done is create a, a, a purchase order for any service or supplies that we expect to pay over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. For instance, if the Securitas, if we knew their services were going to be $50,000 for the year, we would create a purchase order for 50000 at the beginning of the year. And then as the months came came and went, their we would expect to see their invoices come in and their invoices to be paid. So by the time May or June came, you would see that you should only have one or two months' worth of bills left. Um, I think the practice here has been that the, the invoices were not put into the system until they came in the door. A and so that's um, a problem because no one's tracking what's coming in the next few weeks or, and such. That answers my question. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. And I know you're working on it, so thank you. Mr. Gomes, please. This is more of a follow-up. Uh, first of all, thank you for stepping in. I know that's a lot. There's a lot going on. But um, as for late invoices, I was going through the list. Some have dates that go back to 2022. Mm -hmm. So my question is, why haven't these been paid out? And why is it getting paid from this fiscal instead of the previous one? Right. So um, again, I, ha I don't know the dates off the top of my head. I imagine that they must be, they should be from July 1st, 22 or later, because that's when the fiscal period for last fiscal year began. Um, and why ha weren't they paid before? They weren't being tracked um, to know that they were expected to come in. So just to clarify, the invoices dates and the dates that we got them are not the same? Correct. Okay. They just came in within the last few weeks. Do we have anything in place uh, or any agreement with these vendors that, you know, we would expect them to submit these as soon as, you know, the service, the service has been rendered or at least if they're submitting it late, the invoice date should reflect such a date, right? The date should reflect when the service or the supplies were given. Again, you might not have the answer to this. Is this is there any reason why they were coming in late, other than? Uh, personally, I don't know the answer to that. Except, you know, in the one case of the security company, they uh, changed. One company bought out another, and supposedly their billing got messed up, um, and that wasn't caught till this year. wasn't caught till recently. Um, as for why the other vendors sent them in late, I couldn't give you an answer as to their billing practices. I have further question, but I don't think I'll get any answers because you, you're just stepping in, so it's not fair. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gomes. Uh, Ms. Oliver, please. Probably you don't know the answer, but thanks for being here. Do you know when the company, the new company, took over? Because some of these bills, at least 12 of them, is close to almost two years. And I'm concerned that while we're getting this bill so late and right. where we're taking the money from, to try to pay close to $200,000 of late bills, exactly. and we are in the middle of a crisis right now. Exactly. And I think it's a res irresponsible on everybody's part that we're getting some of these bills close to almost two years late. It is very irresponsible uh, for the, the vendors and uh, for us not have tracking that and expected these to come in. Um, it's. It happens on occasion that bills come in from a previous fiscal year. We've had quite a few. And we're hoping to put some procedures in place so that when a good or service is expected over the course of 12 months that we encumber it from day one so that we know that the bills should be coming in. And if they're not, that's when we should be reaching out to the vendors to say, hey, get your bills in right away. So while it is common practice, it, it's been uh, an awful lot have that have come through. Uh, Ms. Azak, please. Uh, thank you. So I appreciate you, like, like my colleagues mentioned, stepping in. So this is before you stepped in. Um, do we, do we timestamp the invoices when they come in, like a date and timestamp? Because I'm looking here and it says date of invoice May 2022 
for services July to, bear with me, um, I think September. So do we, I mean, they're dated in 2022, but when did we actually receive them? And do we have it in their contracts? You want to get paid, you need to give it to us that year, not two years later. Um, so I know that they're, you know, they had transition from one company to another, but do we have that in our contracts with them when they, when they submit this? I don't believe it's in the contracts, but that's a very good thing to put in any contract. I mean, it makes sense. We need to right. pay you within that year's budget. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is, I mean, they're dating these in their defense. They're saying, well, the invoice is dated May of 2022. Right. When did we actually get those invoices? Just within the last few weeks. Okay, so that, I mean, they need to, you know, two years later. Um, and the other question I have is the last one, last page of the um, breakdown. Mm -hmm. So everything else has been broken down, mm -hmm. but this one is just jumbled in as various schools and school building maintenance and monitoring charges for a lump sum of 25385 mm -hmm. So, and there's a, there's a couple of large ones. Are those broken down? Everything else has been broken down by school, um, and those two, the two last two are pretty sizable invoices. Yes, those are broken down. Uh, why they didn't put it in there, I'm not sure. Okay. But the invoices themselves are broken down. Okay, and so do we do we stamp them? I, I know other businesses, when I worked, you know, we used to date stamp when we would get invoices and things like that. Are they date and time stamped when they come in or at least date stamped? I can't positively answer that. I know there's a date stamp in the office. I'm not sure if they actually use it to date stamp them. Okay. So I can't honestly answer that. Okay, I mean, maybe moving forward, we should put something in our agreements. You need to, time is of the essence to get these paid. We can't be paying invoices two years later. That's a great point. I mean, it's just common sense yes. for businesses. You want to get paid, but, and these are sizable bills, but um, I think it would make it easier on the committee, especially when we're reviewing outstanding um, bills. But Absolutely. Thank you so much. I, I know you have your work cut out for you, and we appreciate the time that you're putting into this. And a lot of the questions you're not going to have the answers for, but um, it happened before you stepped in. So, um, but if we could definitely look into that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Please act, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you for your service. And thanks for, thanks for stepping in. Nice job. I just had one quick question. Is there a, do you have a cutoff date for when things should, uh, could be submitted to the fiscal year? I didn't hear the last part. Do you have a cutoff date when bills are submitted for the fiscal year? It's supposed to be July 15th because the fiscal year ends June 30th and July 15th is the usual cutoff date. It, so what normally happens then? You, you don't pay the bills? What happens if something comes if something comes in after the fact? Well, if you know that a bill is coming in, you would encumber it so that it, so when a, when the bill does come in, you can pay it. So when you encumber a bill on June 30th, you have one year to pay that. If it does, if the bill doesn't come in, um, that that money that you encumbered is supposed to go back to the city or town, and in, goes into their free cash. So you try to encumber whatever you think is coming in um, by Ju July 15th. Um, if it doesn't come in by July 15th, but you've encumbered it, you actually have one, one year, one fiscal year to pay that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, followed by uh, Mr. Gomes, please. Hey, Jan, um, you just stepped in to, uh, to try to rectify some issues that uh, exist in finance and this body relies on the professionals that work in the finance department to make sure that we are provided the accurate information mm -hmm. that leads to even sitting in the rooms with unions and negotiating contracts. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that this number here is adding on to the deficit of FY23? It will because it was not budgeted for nor anticipated, so, so yes. So basically the $18.2 million that the city council approved about a month ago is not the accurate number for them to actually uh, pay off this deficit. Well, except that um, it that would be the case, except that we are paying for it with FY24 money. So that means that we are putting ourselves in a deficit with FY24 as well. It's, 
it's got to be taken from somewhere. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's those are unanticipated bills for FY24. Hey, thank you. So, pri I know you just got in. How many people actually work in your office? I'm down to myself, uh, two accounts payable staff, a grant accountant, and uh, one financial assistant. So there's five of us. It's five. Prior to you getting to that position, do you know how many people were working in that office? There would have been, let's see, one, two, three, four, I believe five more in addition to the five we already have. So 50% of that office is depleted. Mm -hmm. Thank you no for the question. Thank you, Mr. Arias. Uh, follow up on Mr. Go are you, you all set? Yeah, my question was already asked. Ms. 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 Boyer, I have a, I have a question. Um, if it wasn't encumbered, mm -hmm. and you've, you've done this a long time, mm -hmm. does this body, does the school committee have the ability to take a vote to pay a previous fiscal year bill? Yes. The, the school committee does? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. But the practice, at least on the city side that I'm aware of, in, when a department knows there's an invoice coming in mm -hmm. after that cutoff date, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to encumber it. That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. So that's very important for budget managers <laughs> to know yeah. if their bills are paid. It's, it's really their responsibility. Uh, Ms. Azak, uh, follow up? Thank you. Um, I, think the, I think maybe you touched base on what I was going to ask. I mean, two years later, are we responsible for this? They, they didn't submit their bills. Right. So are we responsible to pay these? Right. It shouldn't take you a little more than two years to submit a bill, especially when you know we have a budget we have to pay out. Right. And we can't just keep carrying things over. So right. are we legally responsible to have to, where does it say it in their contract that we're legally responsible two years later to pay a bill? Right. Well, I thought they had a, a year. I thought businesses, I don't know how it is with municipalities, but I thought it was one year. I mean, it's, it's two years. If you have a written contract and it's stated in the contract, then you have to follow the contract, but there was no written contract for, for these invoices. So they could come 10 years later and ask for payment. It's up to you to decide if you want to pay them, but um, they can certainly come ask for the funds. But I, I did want to just make one other comment about what you had asked, Mayor. So um, a company can, we have, um, if we have bills that come in from a previous fiscal year, we go to the body and ask that they be paid, um, except if we were going to pay for the invoices from, oops, I have a visitor, <laughs> except if we were going to pay for the funds from a revolving fund. For instance, the school lunch uh, account, um, facilities rental account, revolving funds, you don't need permission from the body or authorization from the body to pay a previous year's invoice, and the same with grants. So this only pertains to the local budget when you're paying bills from the local budget. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Oliver, follow-up, please. Are you able to um, supply us the contract? Do you have those available for us to look at it? For any of those? Yes. I don't believe there was a, oh, sorry. <laughs> There's a fly in my face. Um, I don't believe there was a contract for any of those. How do we? Okay, so we have We're, no contract with any of this for any of this company that's providing service to. Us. I don't believe so. I can double check, but I don't believe that there were, and that's one of the changes that we're going to make going forward as well. Just, just point of information. Um, I, I have expressed to the city council. I mean, not the city council. The city solicitor that in good faith I am not authorizing to pay, if there wasn't a contract formally executed in a meeting of the minds by both parties, in my humble opinion, you don't pay it. So they are looking into that right now. It's not just one or two, there's quite a few that have done services. Um, you know, not to put someone out of business, but what's right is right, what's what wrong is wrong. So just wanted to let everybody know that Megan Bridges is looking into that. She also has assigned another attorney to look in that. Um, but it, doesn't make common sense, business sense, or practical sense to not have a contract between two parties when it's a service. So. Oh. Well, Sorry, at least Jane. for any of the tuition bills, we would have signed placement agreements and contracts for uh, educational services rendered 
uh, through an IEP. So just to be clear. Any additional questions about this right now? I, I would not entertain uh, a motion on this at this time, so please don't <laughs> render one. Um, we, we, we need, um, and again, Trish has been great. Um, she's kind of jumping into it. Um, but we're going to have a very hard conversation with Mr. Plant in a little while ago, uh, in a little bit. Um, we have five months to go, ladies and gentlemen, in this fiscal year. And uh, my email to you on Friday was pretty clear. What I was told on Friday, Dr. Cobbs and I were on a Zoom with Mr. Plant and with Trish and, and Mr. Clarkson. There's some serious concerns with five months to go on certain endeavors, transportation, special ed, uh, individual contracts, unemployment, invoices. So we have a very... Uh, limited time on how we're going to act and how we're going to actually come up with a plan and a process and come up with strategic. Um, but Mr. Plan has a lot to talk to us about tonight. It's fair to say the motion to postpone this item until uh, the city solicitor actually in our legal counsel see if where these contracts lie if it doesn't exist. And I, I, I came in here tonight not supporting this uh, one bit. Yep. Uh, it's uh, kind of crazy getting those two years and digging ourselves another hole which affects our deficit so right. so motion is there motion. a second second motion okay I'm gonna give it to Ms. Oliver <laughs> um, motion was made by Mr. Rodriguez properly seconded by Ms. Oliver all in favor kindly raise your hand we're postponing this matter we're not acting on it those opposed to that motion it does it does prevail so um, that motion is postponed for unpaid bills uh, and Ms. Boyd, you'll be working again with the solicitor as you've been working with uh, to try to get a real understanding right this. Um, yes. Next in item is uh, Dr. Cobbs. It's, uh, I'm sorry. sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Um, so can we m make it like a rule of thumb? Maybe reach out to those and just pretty much tell them anyone that has any outstanding invoices moving forward, you have to get them to us within this year. Um, we don't want to be getting last year's and this year's next year right so it just mm -hmm. we can't have this keep happening right. um mm -hmm. it's their responsibility as business owners to get us this information get us the invoices we don't know what's outstanding if, if it i mean we're looking at stuff two years that happened two years prior so is there um like like an email blast to any something that we can send out to um companies that we work with just if you have anything outstanding please get it to us before this deadline I think, I mean, the solicitor has reached out to certain companies, but I, I don't want to speak for her, she's not here tonight, but she has been intimate um, working with Trish on this. Um, I think it's a good idea. Um, and again, common sense is when you're talking about municipal finance, there's an encumbrance process. You want to get paid, you get it in the fiscal year. So um, I will have Attorney Bridges and her team continue to work with that and report back to us. Thank you. You want to stay there at the podium? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Mr. Rodriguez, please. Just to piggyback off of that, when we talk about contracts, and I, I requested this uh, over a month ago, um, I, I still haven't received the contract with our legal department that, that, that represents the school committee. Um, those bills should be stopped as well until we actually see what we're paying. Um, I haven't seen it in five years. I've asked some other members, they haven't seen it also. So it. it we don't even know what we pay for an hourly rate or what, the, what are we bound by. So mm. I think nothing should be paid until we actually get all these contracts in hand. Duly noted. Thank you. The next uh, agenda item, not to steal your thunder, doctor, is uh, okay. there, there's a potential update, um, but it is an update because he is here via Zoom. Again, he does live in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. TJ Plant from Open Architects, again, being paid by Desi, but we will have to have a conversation soon because Desi is not gonna do it uh, in perpetuity. And so we have to uh, continue to figure out, he's been unbelievable to work with in his team, uh, Jennifer and Larissa, but at some point we have to have a, a conversation. Ms. Oliver. When is the end date that they're still working with Desi? Can, can I ask, ask him? him? Okay. Yeah, they're charged for 24. Uh, they were to look at 25 and 26 projections, but 24 is what they're charged with. TJ, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Good evening. Uh, so yeah, we've been charged by Desi to look at uh, fiscal 24. Uh, I know it has been 
a tremendous challenge for us to get the data we needed to kind of get into the, the weeds and figure out kind of a fiscal 24 deficit. And I know we're going to have, I don't have a number for everyone tonight, but I do have kind of where we're going and uh, it's not necessarily good news uh, in terms of out of district placement and school transportation and some of the other areas that are coming in uh, over budget or unbudgeted and to kind of underscore the conversation you just had with Trish who uh, by the way hands down a tremendous hire that you need at the right time at the right moment to help us figure this out because she has hit the ground running for the last four weeks and she knows what she's doing and we're working very well as a team trying to mitigate numbers that are you know in the millions uh, of, a, of a potential deficit. So I will dive into some of it. I don't have number numbers, but generally speaking, the transportation department did not have a budget when uh, they started the year. The city council voted for a budget for 11.2 million. The school committee asked for 14.4. You're automatically in the hole uh, out of the gate by your statutory appropriation. Add into that all the transportation costs it gets your kids to and from uh, Brockton Public Schools into their programs and if they have um, out of district placements and all that. So those numbers um, are skyrocketing and those numbers are in the millions of dollars. The good news is it's not all doom and gloom is Rock and Public Schools has some cash accounts that Trish and I are working on. We have some revenue and McKinney Vento uh, amount. We got Circuit Breaker. We have ways to kind of mitigate the potential deficit. But the lack of awareness of invoices is, is, is actually causing problems as it relates to um, Rock and public schools. Now, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. We just got a half million dollar dumpster fees that nobody was carrying in a budget. Um, unemployment is projected to be eight hundred thousand plus uh, off of what was budgeted uh, for Rockton. Um, so everything's a moving target, and I hope to have a number in the next week for fiscal twenty four and fiscal 25. Um, I don't know if you guys know what schedule 19 is, but that's city services and support schools. I can't even track down how that number was derived um, to give an accurate net school spending number. So uh, I can get into some details. We can have a conversation. Uh, we have a lot of things on the watch list. Uh, the individual contracts, for example, the folks that have individual contracts can have um, vacation and sick buyback, which could be a potential $2.1 million problem. We have 150 vacancies that, um, if they get filled, that could be at least a $6 million problem. Um, you know, we have the, this invoice out of nowhere for some AEDs for a service warranty for 170 grand. Um, you just talked about the, the bills of prior year that was postponed because of questions on contract and whatever. All of that is making it that we cannot come up with a number that I could sit here with a straight face and tell you that we have, this is the number and here's how we solve it. So. PJ, can I jump in? Cause I wrote down some notes on our conversation uh, Friday afternoon before I emailed the committee. You said charter of accounts not organized in a lo logical way uh, to extract financial information. Could you explain what charter of the accounts are? And then I want to talk about grants because I'm stupefied that grants from previous years were never closed out. Uh, there was no centralization of those. Um, they weren't just managed properly to this day. And I know Trish is looking at grants, but this is knowledge that we have to share with the committee because it, it, it just it's baffling. So yeah, great, great points, Mayor. And uh, absolutely, the 
chart of accounts is basically how Munis is set up, where you pay your bills. Munis is a system of record, so that is what is um, the auditors and DOR and everyone else looks at as, as in terms of like how you pay your bills. So you do a requisition, you do a purchase order, you, li- you pay an invoice, you liquidate the invoice. Uh, the chart of accounts in Brockton does not follow the typical chart of accounts as it relates to uh, city, uh, I won't say the city because I don't know, but the school department. Like, grants should have a logic to them in terms of year and a project code, but they have random letters. And, you know, I'll, I'll make it up, but, you know, a P is for like fiscal 2023, an M is fiscal 2022, and stuff that just does not generally make it easy for a year to year comparison. So that is, the chart of accounts is a problem because we couldn't extract the financial data in order to truly show what it is Brockton is spending because the money is moving from line item to line item from all these different funding sources to all these different, um, you know, I know we talk about the 199 account. There's so, there are so many things, there are so many moving pieces. It is tough to get a history of Brockton public school spending. And that is, the history is what you rely on to do your projections for fiscal 25 and 26 and 27 and beyond. And we have had so much trouble backing into those numbers and figuring it out that I think we're 95% there that we can we can figure out the number and actually present something to the school, to, to the school committee issue is that is just the general fund to get to the grants problem you have a significant problem with grants paying payroll from fiscal 21 22 23 that are closed out grants that no longer exist that have been closed out by desi and payroll is going to hit no matter what and people are getting paid which is thereby creating further deficits beyond the general fund numbers, beyond the, um, you know, kind of current, you know, view of where we're at and could potentially be at. And we just need to have an honest conversation and shut those accounts down and literally shut them down in units. So people can't get paid, move the employees to a suspense account or some other account figure out if they go back to a different grant or if they stay in the general fund, all policy decisions that need to be made, but we're not stopping the bleeding and it is ongoing. And that's something we need to actually do as a district and figure out as a district, like the best way. And I have had some ideas. I presented some to Troy. I think we're going to get ready to move on a couple just to kind of, shut it down and then just determine where they belong. I mean, I think I, I mentioned last time we're doing a roster review because everyone's location seems to be off or not everyone, a numerous employees location seem to be off. So we're trying to make sure the HR is lining up where they belong. So the cost centers are accurate and the, 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 the budget for each uh, school and location is accurate. Um, I mean, there's just so much happening, and I know there were presentations for the budget looking like it was fine or generally okay, but there are so many misbudgeting, misbudgeted items that is from un- unpaid invoices to out of district placements to transportation that are causing serious problems for Brockton. One more follow up and I'm going to open it up to the committee. Um, it's been mentioned, you mentioned it tonight, these individual contracts um, and which again is mind numbing because there shouldn't be a lot of contracts other than for certain positions, right? I mean, employees at will is, is how municipalities function. At least that's always been my understanding. But these contracts that you shared with me on Friday, TJF, 
benefits in there where if someone's getting paid a salary but then they get overtime um, and retro payments and stuff like that. I, could you just explain that to the committee? Because again, I, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so um, we've kind of basically uncovered that there's probably about 125 to 150 individual contracts that folks have that mirror some of the bargaining agreements for uh, the BEA and others that entitle them to a vacation payout that they buy back five to 10 days, a sick leave payout that buys them back five to 10 days, severance pay, uh, and other just uh, overtime is another one that they're, even if they're a six figure employee, they're getting overtime uh, that just, you know, has cost the districts at least. Our quick estimate is for the buyouts alone is $2.1 million. And that's not part of any figure we have right now because I don't know who's going to elect to buy to get a buyout. But two point one million dollars, if everyone elects to buy it out, then that's going to add to whatever deficit that we come up with in the next few days or next week. And it's legit. Like, I and I mean, I don't know. Other than the fact that they entered into these agreements, I don't understand why that they entered into these agreements with. Like I understand with principals, assistant principals, and directors, but there are so many other employees that have these agreements that provide them with lucrative benefits and chances to to uh, enhance their salary that just does not work for Brockton overall finances or overall you know the uh, public school finances and net school spending. Point of information, the committee, uh, I've asked the solicitor, the solicitor's office have requested through Dr. Moran uh, every single contract uh, on the school side. Uh, we wanna see what the term is, we wanna see if there's renewal options in there, we wanna see when the notice has to give, if, if there's a termination. Um, I just wanna let you know that, because I have not in my life as a lawyer experienced a lot of different, 125 different employment. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, Ms. Ehlers, please. Um, I'm going to follow up to your question because I was actually interested when you mentioned earlier about the individual contracts. Um, TJ, can you can you talk about which line items that you see right now that are that you think are underfunded or have been misfunded in some ways? Like, I obviously transportation is one of them because you mentioned that, but can you go into like the severity of transportation? Like, where like when we're talking overspends, do you have an idea of what that overspend looks like? Uh, not 100%, but the best thing we have right now, uh, transportation, uh, 1.3 million in uh, in-district net school spending, three, just over 3 million in out-of-district um, placement transportation, McKinney Ventos, 380,000, and a variety of other accounts uh, you know the vehicles. You've seen the vehicles, the three hundred eighty thousand or whatever that was overspent in, the, in buying a second vehicle that wasn't allowed on the grant. Um, beyond transportation, uh, the special ed, uh, private placements, residential placements, homeless, and collaboratives are all trending two to three million dollars off a of budget, and. Like I said, I haven't fully been able to calculate the, the, the full severity of the deficit, and I don't have a number, and I, I, I don't think I can put a number out there publicly right now, um, because we have solutions potentially for fiscal 24. It's not gonna solve everything, but there's McKinney-Vento money that was put into a cash account. There's a school choice revolving account we have the $7 million uh, or so in circuit breaker. We have 5.1 million in unspent ESSER funds that we can talk about. And then we have some of the OTPS that just hasn't been touched in the first seven months of the fiscal year. So we have potential solutions that Trish and I are working on. And it's just a matter of the will of the committee and what the other pieces that we're tracking in terms of expense. 
of what that means to the bottom line. And I, I, I hope that makes sense. I, you know. It does. It just, um, I think, I think the conversation that we had prior to your presentation with Trish in regards to the unexpected invoices, you know, we're already getting invoices that are two years old, one and two years old. I think my concern is this is what we know about, but it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, it's what we don't know about that we're trying to figure out and we don't know that we don't know. So I have a tracking list of all the issues that uh, are potentially financial, financially going to impact Rockton Public Schools. And it is not an exhaustive list. Uh, it is some of what you know about. I mentioned the dumpster bills for $500,000. Uh, there's some utilities that I'm <laughs> hoping are fully encumbered and ready to, to get paid as they get you know submitted. Um, and then there's the missed service hours of the IEPs that students are entitled to get the hours that are in their IEP that we just haven't had as a district, haven't had a chance to, haven't been able to provide. And there are conversations about what that's going to cost and what that looks like. That I just think, as a school committee and as as a district, we need to talk about. Uh, I know there's a plan, a potential plan, um, to provide an outside vendor to bring people, uh, students up to their hours, and you know that may solve it. It may not solve all of it. it may just solve part of it, but. These are honest conversations that we need to have. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Oliver, please. Um, TJ, um, thank you for not sugarcoating anything, for being very transparent with what's going on. Um, I have a few questions. I don't know if my colleagues would know, but who is in charge to keep track of the grants when they're about to close? Um. I'm just going to be 100% honest. Your grants process is is decentralized and not cohesive and not set up in a way that makes business sense as it relates to how they've been administered. And I uh, maybe I'm speaking too bluntly, but sorry. Um, your your grants you need to have a grants director that understands the fiduciary responsibility of what the grants mean. And then you need the programmatic folks to administer it. That did not exist in Brockton, uh, as far as I can tell, based upon the fact that grants were closed out but not shut down in Munis. That's causing your problems. Great. Um, also, regarding the payrolls, once the grants uh, were closed, where were we taking money from to pay this payrolls? Are you, are you able are to locate them? Those are actually running deficits, and that deficit is going to hit the city's free cash number ultimately at the end of the day. Okay. I know last time when you were here, you also uh, mentioned that I think it's the 199 account. Can you explain that exactly? No, uh, I'll do my best to explain what I understand it to be, if that makes sense. Uh, the 199 account has been where most of the money appropriated by the school committee has, has flowed through the pay bills and set up to um, make it easier to move money when you need to get money into different locations in the budget. And I don't know if that makes sense to you, but let me give you an example. Um, I'll say fiscal 21 or 22, 100 and 39 million, 149 million was put in the 199 account, and your budget's 234 million today. And the money was moved out based upon the needs of the district. And my summation is A, it shouldn't have been in the 199 account, and B, if money's moving at that level, it should be go for the school committee. And you did not, sorry. the money moved to wherever it needed to be and you were not informed as a, as a committee. And um, right now the 199 account is, it's really what makes a lot of what we've been trying to do for Brockton complicated because 
everything that doesn't have a line item or a grant account defaults to this 199 account overtime uh class coverage all the other than base pay stuff like flows to this account that is next to impossible to track in any meaningful way to show a cost center as it relates to central office or Brockton High School or you know Cliff School or any of those other ones. So um, it is something that should be shut down in my estimation and um, making sure it doesn't happen again and we should budget the proper cost centers with the proper overtime and the proper everything for every employee that is entitled to it. And the 199 account has just been a huge challenge to wrap our head around and to wrap the number or figure out the numbers to that to make that make sense. Do you know who has been managing that account? I do not know who's managing it. Uh, I know you're running into a problem now with the 199 account because what I understand is it's going to be out of money soon. And because everything's hitting it that wasn't budgeted for. And you have a lot of things that were not budgeted. I definitely agree that we need to figure out this um, 150 contract that's out there. And it's, it's mind blowing that a person has, has salary is getting overtime over their salary. I'm a salary, I don't get overtime. I work what I have to work as a director. I have to do what I gotta do, but to get overtime over your salary and the payback, we're, we're giving out sweet deals. And this is why we're in a crisis and nobody was managing it. I don't know if we have a, a money tree in the back somewhere, but, but this got to stop. This is- It was mind blowing. It's, my, I, it's mind blowing. And I truly appreciate all the work you, um, you have been doing and definitely continue to be very transparent, continue to not sugar things. And I definitely, this is why we need this audit. This is why we need to get this audit going to figure out what else has been happening, the things that we still don't know that's out there that's gonna come rolling in. Thank you. Thank you, TJ. Um, actually, Ms. Oliver touched base on a few of my questions. So um, I just want to thank you. Um, we got to stop the sugar coating. We need to know where we stand. And tonight was definitely an eye opener. As far as this 199 account, can we just close it once it's done? Like, can you just be like, we don't need it. It got us where we are. Um, and as far as the what is it, 125, 150 contracts? Can we get a spreadsheet with who they are? When were these contracts signed? When do they expire? and the dollar amount um, along with the contracts so we can just make it easier to go through them. Um, if, if, if HR can help us with that. Dr. Moran is working on that to get it to law. As soon as she compiles it, you'll get it as well. Okay. So I'm anxious to see it. Okay. Um, no, thank you so much. And actually, um, Mr. Plant, we really appreciate all the help that you've helped our school committee in stepping in um, along with Desi for sending you. So we do appreciate it. Um, this is why we, where we are where we are. And for those watching, we don't have access to this. You have professionals that are doing this, that are finding out this information, bringing it to us, where we actually had professionals in those positions thinking they're looking out for our best interest, but this is where we are. And, and this is heartbreaking to know that we knew we were gonna have issues, but we, ha we haven't even done an audit. We have no clue where we are. We have outstanding invoices two years later so um, it's sad, it really is, that we need to just stay focused and get through this. But um, we, we gotta just get through and get that audit done. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chairman, can I comment real quick? <coughs> uh, absolutely, yes, followed by Ms. Uh, Rodriguez. Yeah. So the 199 account, uh, that is gonna be like whack-a-mole. It's gonna, you know, you shut it down, it's gonna pop up a bunch of stuff that's gonna need to get fixed, which may, be okay if we're ready uh, because that's what's going to pop up is people aren't going to get their overtime or their expected pay or whatever and the committee just needs to be ready for the fallout or potential um, ire of employees that 
you know, think they're getting whatever number of hours overtime or whatever. And when it's out of money, it's the numbers. And I know I said payroll's going to hit, but if we shut it down, everything everything's going to pop out, and we just need to be ready to fix it. On the business office side, your business office is broken. The staff is not adequately trained to deal with net school spending in the way to administer a $300 million budget on behalf of Rockland students. Um, there's going to need to be a reorganization of the business office. Um, you know, and I think, I don't know if that's lost, I don't think it's lost on anyone, but there's going to need to be a, a relook at roles and responsibilities and what we expect out of the business office and how the business office can better serve principals, how the business office can better serve central office, and how the business office can better serve the school committee uh, to give you the information to make the right decisions and the right recommendations. And I'm committed to working with Trish to figuring that out. I have a number of ideas of what that looks like or could look like for Brockton. And but your business office needs to fundamentally be redesigned with a budget director, a grants director, a CFO, um, and analysts that are trained, adequately trained to do what they need to do. Rodriguez, please. Thank you, TJ. Before I ask you this question is, when you talk about the 125, 150 contracts, my personal knowledge when I looked into this when I got on the committee is that the school committee lacked the oversight from the superintendent actually giving these one-on-one -on -one contracts. So he just put whatever dollar amount he wanted and he signed it and it never came before this body for an approval. So if he wanted to give somebody 350000 he gave him 350000 I don't know where that money was coming from or what line item that they were moving monies to to give these contracts, but from the contracts that I've seen it, it's like, this is nuts. This is really nuts. From the numbers that, that you've provided, um, one of the things that, that's really shocking to me is that I asked how much money we had in ESSA funds, and, we, and I was told that we depleted it, but you're telling me right now that we have $5 million left in that account. Is that correct? Uh, could you rephrase that? Could you speak on the microphone? I didn't hear that part. I, I asked if the, the ESSA funds um, this is going over a year ago. If it, you know, how much money do we have left? Because I, you know, with my math, and I, I know there was some money left, but I was told that it was depleted. But you're telling me that we actually have five million left in the ESSA account? Yeah, five point one million that needs to be spent by September thirtieth. Okay. So it's it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you're still working on this, but it's fair to say that this body is going to have to approve a number and the chairman, the mayor, is going to have to go in front of the city council to bail itself out, FY24? No, I, I'll be honest about that. Um, the bailout that we just did for FY23 included uh, depleting a stabilization of 7.9. By law, we have to pay that back. So we're already, the city side, we're already in trouble, right? What we need to do, and TJ, I don't want to steal your thunder, but you were expressing some things about strategic solutions. We need to look about freezes. We have five months. We have to stop the hemorrhaging. So I'm only one vote, but we have to look at freezes, cost containment freezes. We have to. We have to look at contracts and, and, and cancel them. I mean, not at the jeopardy of the kids, right? I mean, if there's contracts that help the kids, I get it. but. If we're looking right now five months to go and he's telling us that we might be able to get it down with these creative endeavors, great. But we're supposed to be planning FY25 right now. So it's, it's a slippery slope. The, the city side cannot bail it out. It can't. So what, besides free, like what can we do um, to really stop, stop this bleeding, like right now? You know, because, you know, when I look at somebody that's getting a six-figure contract and again overtime on a weekly basis, that's, that's crazy. And, and, you know, we have lack of educators in the classroom and we're paying somebody overtime? Mayor, may, may I jump in? Yeah, you're the expert. 
Um, so, other than what we don't know of the invoices and a few of the other decisions that need to be made related to services and the Huntington School and grants, we have a path to kind of balance strategically and figure out most of the problem. That's going to take time for Trish and I to kind of work through the ESSER 5.1. We have unspent OTPS of 2.8 million. We have the painful conversation that we're going to need to have about one-to-one -one technology and whether or not to move forward with uh, technology purchases for laptops to keep the kids at one-to-one. -one. And uh, I'm not I'm not advocating not to do it. I just, we need to talk about it. We have the school choice revolving account that we came across and we're already reclassing the Kenny Vento costs to free up money. So um, Jen Perez and the transportation department can pay bills, but bills are coming in every month that we're that have not been budgeted for SPED and have not been budgeted for out of district. And we do have circuit breaker, but it's not going to solve all of it. And I didn't anticipate this blunt be to be this blunt tonight. Uh, no, yes. I'm no, glad, no, I'm glad, no. I'm glad you lied, DJ. I told you that going into it. But I'm, I'm also I very wanna, proud you're not I'm using the profanity you use, use with me, so that's good. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, my only comment is we're on it to the best of our ability and I'll be 100% open and honest with this committee and the mayor and his team and Dr. Cobbs and his team about what the recommendations we would make and or uh, just kind of highlight where all the issues are because I am close to doing fiscal 25. I need some numbers from the city that Troy's working on for Schedule 19. And the Student Opportunity Act goes up a nice amount for Brockton, but I don't think it's necessarily gonna be enough to solve fiscal 25 and fiscal 25 is gonna be a problem. Oh, sorry. When, trying to, one of the things that upsets me and I, and I know it's gonna accept some, is that knowing that we are in a deficit, it upsets me that I had to sit down with other members, with unions, and negotiate a contract so they can earn an honest living. And we, 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 I felt that I, I, was, I sat down in the room with these unions and basically dug the district a hole. Like we just created a deficit by, that's how I feel right now. So you, you're telling me that this committee sat in rooms with the unions and we're told the number and we just basically created a deficit on top of a deficit. Like how do you do that? That's criminal. Can I, can I ask a quick question? And maybe I'm out of line, but um, have your, Every contract should be costed out related to what you're thinking of doing in terms of lane steps, increases, and whatnot. Has this committee seen any of that ever before, or is that new? I, I bring it up because there's bilingual facilitators that are about to get a retro of 10 grand each that I don't know if you were aware of what the cost is going to be that adds to the deficit. I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear you. Could you say that again, TJ? Something about $10,000 facilitator? Yeah, so bilingual facilitators just entered into an agreement that I believe was signed off by the school committee that uh, given them a $10,000 retro for all of them. And there's 14, which is 140 grand, so it's not you know terrible, but I don't know if that filters through the rest of the bilingual 
uh, facilitators that might not be part of that union. So I got to look into that. But this committee should have a presentation of whatever it costs as you enter into executive session to negotiate contracts with your unions. You should know what every penny is going to be. And I'm not sure that happens. This, I mean, when we sit into the contract negotiations with these unions, we're relying on the uh, financial team that puts those numbers together. What can we afford? Are we costing ourselves out? Are we basically, you know, giving increases? And, you know, are we able to sustain that? So that's how these contracts and also with our legal team, you know, as far as looking at those languages. But knowing that you're telling us, you know, we're in a deficit and this happened in the previous year and we're going into another fiscal year, we're in a deficit and it's increasing. I, I just sat down with the union not too long ago negotiating a contract. The year before we sat down doing contracts and that's what we ask when we make our decision is can we afford this? We're not working in finance. We're told we're given these numbers and that's how we base our decision. But sitting here now looking at these numbers and what you're telling us and you don't have the, the final numbers yet is that we relied on people to basically have us sit in a room knowing that we had a deficit and we just dug ourselves a hole. Like we, we basically voted in a deficit and we basically sat there and laid these people off by giving them money. That, that, that upsets me. That's upsetting that people in the finance basically made us sit there knowing that we didn't have money to give money and put us in this position that we're in now because we're the ones that vote on that. So how do we move forward knowing that we just negotiated a contract and I believe we're supposed to be going into executive session to deal that to even approve that because sitting in there is basically we're digging ourselves another hole. I mean, well, yes, let us help solve fiscal 24's current issue and see how close we can get to zero and recommend areas where we can stop spending. Um, and then let me calculate, finish the calculation for fiscal 25 to know how bad it's going to be and present to this committee in a couple weeks, all of that. A, a follow-up question is once the school committee, we approve a budget, whose job is it? Or is it one person, two, is it a team to actually input those numbers into Munis? And who actually monitors that to make sure that we are not trending into a deficit because you know, when we were sitting in a council review, uh, myself, Mrs. Ellis, I mean, the other two were not here. I mean, what we were asking for, it was, you know, like, we need this document to show us. And then we get it when we were told that we were in this big hole. You know, we were told it wasn't done. So it was just like, now we know why we were told it wasn't done, because they were trying to hide something. They were, they were hiding it from us. Eventually, it was going to catch up. But whose, whose task is that? Like, who actually inputs these numbers into Munis to make sure it reflects what we voted on? Because what I was told, if I'll leave that for I different. I can answer that question, uh, Mr. Rodriguez. It, in my estimation and world, it should be the city auditor and on the city side to make sure the books tie out to what is voted on by the school committee and ultimately the city council and that they all tie out as the system of record in Munis. What did not happen, and I don't understand why, is that there was a lot of ability for folks on the school side to set up their own budgets in Munis, to not abide by the 11.2 million in the transportation appropriation, even though that was woefully underfunded, which is fine, I understand that. Um, but there's no reason Munis should not tie out the entire budget of the city inclusive of net school spending for the school department and I would tell Troy that falls on the city auditor 
to make sure that happens. And I think he knows that given his, uh, you know, chapter 373, whatever his, his authority is under that law, like he has similar authorities to be able to do that. Um, the school department should not be able to move money in grants and should not be able to move money in the general fund without the approval of the CFO and the auditor. A follow-up when somebody logs into munis is there a, a a record kept of when they logged in did they move money did they approve i mean i've never seen munis like myself personally on the screen but does it keep track of that so if i log in it shows well mr rodriguez logged in and he approved x amount of dollars or he increased this number is there does does munis track yeah. that i'm that not exists. That, ex that does exist. Uh, Trish, you can answer that one if you want. Well, but. I was going to say, I'm not positive about that, but I know that it does have a really good tracking history. There's an audit trail that will track all pretty much every movement from journal entries to moving the money. Uh, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you, Trish, Trish, I don't know if you have anything to add. I just may have stole all your thunder, but... I just have to see if any new members before I do a follow-up. Any new, any any comments from anybody that hasn't spoken yet? I'll go back to Ms. Oliver, please. I know you have mentioned it um, last meeting. You were here also on this one that the transportation the, um, is stating they had no budget. Is that correct? What you said there was no budget. Is that what they're saying? There's no budget. Yeah. So transportation does not have a formal budget that's built up from the ground up and neither does uh, special ed and out of district division. So a decision was made by Brockton Public Schools uh, to move 20 students from in district to out of district. And it should have been presented to the school committee as if we do this, here's what's gonna cost. And I don't believe it was done. And that cost of 3.9 million that was spent by the city to cover that deficit for fiscal 23 and that is starting to cover some of the deficits or excuse me cause some of the deficits deficits for fiscal 24. and those are policy decisions that i don't disagree with the kids you know are entitled to the services and i'm not saying pass a judgment on that it's just an expense that the school committee should have been aware of as the decisions were made Thank you. PJ, I just had a question about Munis to follow up on what Mr. Rodriguez said. Um, the CFO, Troy, Troy had said to us that when he started to do some due diligence on the Munis on the school side, there was a capability, which again is mind blowing, a capability to do an override. Um, had you ever seen that in your past experience with other municipalities? I know it was shut down, but I don't know how long it was running. I'm glad that there's a, a genetic code so we'll be able to see who did what. but. But have you ever seen that before where, I mean, Munis is supposed to itemize the budget and what the budget is. Had you ever seen anybody be able to override that? No, that is unique to Brockton uh, as far as I understand. <laughs> like I've never heard of an override. I never understood how you could override because everything that would happen in the world of municipal finance and school finance is you don't override, you move the budget and you move the budget either under statutory authority as it relates to how the budget was adopted or you move it, or you move it by going to the school committee uh, or the city council was on the city side. Like all of it's prescribed by law. Like I don't understand how an override can even happen. I just, I, I got a question for you again and I'm not, as a chair, I'm not trying to hog it, but I, I had a, a question. So you're saying you need a little bit more time to work with, with Trish and your team um, to give us some more suggested solutions. But this committee has to act soon, um, working in conjunction and collaboration with Dr. Cobbs. But so do you, I mean, what's today? The sixth, fifth, sixth? Do, do you, how much time do you think? Because, you know, then we're half month and we're four and a half months to get, get rid of the end of the fiscal year. So what, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Uh, I would probably say by next Monday or Tuesday, we might be able to have a better solid number of something that 
we're willing to present publicly knowing that it's our best thinking at the time and it can subject to change based upon a variety of factors. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ayla's follow-up, please. Um, TJ, I don't know why, but I just cannot get off these contracts. It's driving me crazy. I'm sorry, so I want to go back to it for a second. But just a clarification question. If we have 125 to 150 contracts, what, like normally, that, that live outside of Munis, which is what these are now, what normally does a district our size, how, like what, what's the normal amount of contracts that you have that, that are not part of a collective bargaining agreement like that, and would they in fact live in Munis moving forward? Excellent question. Generally, my understanding, and so statutorily, it's the superintendent, the deputy superintendent, and the school business administrator that's approved by the school committee uh, as it relates to contracts that have formal contracts. And then I've seen directors of, you know, central office get contracts. The contracts generally, you know, just spoke about vacation time and whatever, not like lucrative benefits issue you have that from what I can tell in Brockton is the contracts are vaguely worded referencing other contract benefits that it's subject to interpretation that I talked to Megan Bridges about because they are like it doesn't say hey I'm a you know hundred thousand dollar employee and I get overtime it says language like Link to section this of the BEA contract, you can get overtime based upon what these guys can get overtime on. And that, to me, is where the questions lie. Like, it's vague enough to sit there and say, yeah, I can interpret it this way, or I can interpret it another way. I'll leave that for the lawyers to work out, but if you go through them, there are a number of them that are just, it doesn't say overtime explicitly or it doesn't say you know uh, vacation buyback explicitly it, it, it refers to what other benefits that other uh, bargaining units get and so back to like in, in terms of like a district our size like how like how like how many contracts I would probably say you'd have 20 to 25 max and that would be all your directors and that would be you know uh, and, and some principals, I don't even think principals necessarily all get contracts, but they usually, the, the contracts really come down to um, the incentives for, for pay. And do you meet your MCAS stores, scores, or do you meet your, you know, whatever, you know, suspensions or lack of, whatever the district decides, that's generally what the contracts are for, not for an attendance officer or a one-to-one -one nurse or a, whatever title has them. I mean, it goes down the entire um, system that it's like, they're just employees at will. And they're not. And they have this contract to lean on that is just costing the district a fortune. I mean, who of us wouldn't love to catch out 10 vacation days every year? Right. This point of information on the city side, I've only done two contracts. Please, Chief Fire Chief. That's it. Everybody else will play it well. Thank you, TJ. Uh, any, any additional comments or questions for TJ or, or Trish? Thank you very much for standing there. Um, so TJ, I, I, I know you had said next Monday or Tuesday, um, and of course I'm gonna talk to you before that with Dr. Cobbs and we'll, we'll get an email out to the committee again. Um, but as I said to you, you know, talking to you today, I didn't want you to hold back, throw it at it, pull the Band-Aid off, we need to. So um, I, thank you for doing that. I hope you guys, I, I didn't hold back and we'll see how that plays out publicly, but um, the committee needed to know and needs to understand that you need to have the information to make the right decisions going forward. And, um, you know, I will commit from, to give you everything that I know as soon as I know it uh, and I'm comfortable sharing it and I'll, if I have to caveat it because of the unknowns I will but I just want I want the committee to to trust that you know we have done so much due diligence Brockton so much digging into your numbers 
I know more about Brockton than I probably do about Springfield. And I spent Springfield 17 years to turn them around. I know what I'm doing. I have done it for uh, Springfield Public Schools. I've done it. We had a control board in Springfield. I've done it with them. Like, I, I can lend some advice to, to Trish and her team and the mayor and the school committee as we move forward. So um, I feel like I'm the right person for the job. I feel like I've uh, got sucked in and not realizing just this is what uh, I was getting into. But uh, I have enjoyed trying to help Brockton Public Schools figure, their, figure this out. And we thank you. We also thank Commissioner Jeff Riley because you wouldn't be here without him. So, um, you know, we, we will continue to work with you. I mean, it's not all gloom and doom. You said there are some mechanisms, some, some type of um, financing endeavors that you might be able to bring to us next Tuesday. It's going to make us feel a little bit better. But at the end of the day, we have to figure this out. We will figure this out. We thank you and, and Trish for helping us as well. Any other comments or questions at this time? Mr. Rodriguez, please. Comment from Dr. Cobb. So, with these one-on-one -on -one contracts, if they're doing overtime, that has to get approved by you, Mr. Dr. Cobbs, isn't that correct? That's correct. So, as we haven't seen a lot of these contracts, are they actually getting overtime? Is the overtime in the contract? Or some, some of them there are, yes. So there's no authority right now because those contracts are signed that we can stop that? Right, not all of them, but some of them are. For example, the uh, bilingual coordinators, the, the liaisons, they have overtime built in, the, the uh, custodian, of course, they're union members, but some of the people, yeah, they, they are built in. Not all of them, but um, some. I think that not all of them, you, you should, speaking for myself, if they're not by contract entitled to it if it's kind of optional mm -hmm. let's halt it right now right. let's halt it across the board mm -hmm. unless we have to do it just pause it and that's just my humble opinion but mm -hmm. uh, agreed agreed mm -hmm. motion. motion motion how do you want me to verbalize that committee would um would uh ask dr cobbs to uh, halt uh, approving any uh, overtimes that are not mandated by contract. Uh, motion to have Dr. Cobbs not approve any overtime in contracts that do not have the verbiage included in them at, for overtime pay. But at this point, anybody that has a contract that does not include overtime is going to be managed to no overtime. Effective today. Effective today, February 6th. So form of a motion to a second. Second. Motion was made by Ms. A. It was probably seconded by Mr. Rodriguez and Mrs. Sullivan. Uh, on the motion? No. Oh, all in favor of that? All opposed? Uh, it's ratified unanimously. Thank you. PJ, any last thoughts before we let you go? No, let me know if you need anything, and I'll be in touch uh, in the coming days, and I'll be working with Trish uh, pretty much tomorrow and the rest of the week. So Thank you. Uh, whatever you guys need, let me know. Thank you for what you're doing. Enjoy Springfield. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Tough conversation, but conversations needed. And and Trish has been great, and uh, she she she'll take your call. She she's she's digging in. So um, we'll continue on the agenda item. Um, D. Are there any items to refer to subcommittee at this time, Dr. Cobbs, that you're aware of? Uh, well, we we actually have scheduled for subcommittee is the cell phone the uh, policy you know subcommittees for the cell phone and laptop restitution. You know where it's it's ten o'clock tonight. We were going to have a discussion about the cell phone policy, but I think we can we can wait um, to to go further in depth on the thirteenth about it. Um, one of the things that I like to just bring up to the attention of the, the school committee is that we. We, we have a cell phone policy in, place, policy in place, and obviously everybody knows now that we were not able to enforce it, you know, the, the part where we actually have the students put their cell phones in the pouch after so many you know, uh, offenses regarding their cell phones. So we already voted on that on August 15th, and so I just want to make sure you understand that we're going to start enforcing that policy while we're reviewing the new policy that we'll hopefully put in place before the school year ends. So um, to do that, you know, part of the problem that we didn't enforce it or were, weren't able to it because we were unable to, at the time we had to lease the pouches for the cell phones um, and lease enough for all the students, high school students in the district. So 
the company that we are going to work with has changed their policy. We're actually going to purchase the, um, the pouches and, and so we can, in order to enforce the policy and just enough for the high school, which as we discussed at prior meetings, it's for 4,000 pouches at a price of $40 each. So it's, it's about 135,000 with the pouches in and the training and, and support for the system. So those, the representatives will be here tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock to walk to the high school to kind of lay out the, the program. Um, and at, the, at that time, I'll give them the purchase order to purchase the, the pouches. I just asked you a question on that. We spoke in my office last mm -hmm. week. It was about 137 for the pouches, but you said there might have been an option. It's not a, a bag or whatever that bag's called, but it's more of a plastic container that could be more financially cheaper. Have yeah, we... We never received it. You know, I, I we, we requested from the company. Dr. Connors, you were working with them on that. Do you, do you have any update on that? The plastic cases that were um, you know, different. Thing. So there's a, we all get solicited emails all the time, and usually I send them to a, a different file. Um, but this one was called New Germ, and they're plastic cases. And so think of those. CD cases. Almost. Thank you. CD cases. Like what? What is everybody going to understand? Um, it's the same locking mechanism and the same magnet. So I do have one. I've been playing phone tag with the representative. They're nine ninety five a, a case. So considerably less expensive. So um, something to think about. But it's just um, I only have one. And like I said, we've been playing phone tag. He just it just came across my desk maybe a week ago. I think right. you and yeah. I and we Sharon talked about that. it. So like There's we don't know either other with options. the same support, you know, with the training policy and, and, and setting up these systems for us either. So we really don't know, you know, if this company has a proven track record or not. Uh, Ms. Ayles, please, followed by Mrs. Sullivan, please. Um, I just want to clarify, like when we first looked at, to your point and to Dr. Connor's point, they're $40 now. When we looked at these, and this is an example of the yonder bag that it we have. They were 12. Right. You know, like they were $12 when we mm -hmm. first looked at them like a year ago, and now they're $40. Mm -hmm. So number one, what that says to me is that there are a lot of school districts that are looking at doing exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And number two, we need to find a cheaper option. And so I'm willing to consider anything, but we need a cell phone policy that's going to allow our teachers the ability to stabilize the classroom in the hallways. I just think that this is something that we need to do. And so I guess what I want to clarify, Dr. Cobbs, is what you were saying is that we right now are in the process of, we want to enforce the existing cell phone policy we have. Yonder's coming in tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, you said, and that's they're going to walk the building. Right. And in the meantime, Dr. Connors, are you going to follow up with that other um, company to see if that's, I mean, because we're not, I mean, we're not married to this. We're just married to the idea of a cell phone policy and a place to put them. I, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but that's how I feel. Yeah, absolutely. We were scheduled um, to actually chat this morning at 9, and then I got pulled in some different directions, so we've been emailing back and forth, so mm -hmm. I can just reset up that call mm -hmm. and talk about it. But it is the same locking mechanism, the magnet, yeah. um, the whole bit. Just well, you can buy you. four for the price of one. Absolutely, yes. And I do question, I'll be honest, I question the durability, because when I got the sample, that's the first thing I said. I'm like, I feel like I could stomp on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it would break. And um, again, we've plastic, only been right? mm -hmm. emailing. So he said they have been tested. I don't know if I can't recall off the top of my head, but that was one question because I, mm -hmm. I want my phone bad enough. And we all know social media and cell phones are a true addiction. They will get those cell phones. Yeah. Um, so thank and, you. And I think part of the reason why the price changed so much from when we first looked into this is because we were with a lease. Uh, Program. It wasn't a purchase program, so now we're buying them outright. So I think the company built that into their price to, to sell it outright. Are you all set, Mrs. Ailis? Uh, yeah, uh, Mrs. Sullivan, please. Um, Dr. Cobbs, am I a question for you? Am I correct in saying that we have the minutes in front of us from the August 15th meeting um, that we passed a dress code, right. electronics policy, attendance policy, and right. bullying policy? Mm -hmm. So I know some teachers are concerned there's not an attendance policy, but we did pass an attendance policy. Correct. So those four policies we did pass on August 15th. Right. So we should be 
making sure those are being followed. So do you that's correct. All so, right, thank you. So, and again, the other reason we couldn't do the cell phone policy is because we, we never purchased a product or leased a product. So yes. we, everything else we, we have. Okay. So there is a tenant's policy? That's correct. I, I made a mistake. I'm just going to read in the record agenda four because that's what we're on. Uh, review and approval of specific product and high school policies, including cell phones and drugs slash vaping. That's mm -hmm. agenda four tonight. Mm -hmm. So what is the suggestion, doctor? So I think we'll we'll hold on purchasing the the uh, yonder pouches until we get more information from the other company. Um, but I, my suggestion is that we'll. Well, I gave you a draft of the policy that my cabinet and I and the high school leadership teams are working on. I know Mr. Rodriguez had wanted other input uh, from either teachers or, or other, other uh, parties, so that will take time. So, you know, we'll, so I think we'll come back with this draft policy on, on the 13th when we can review it in more depth. And, and again, given the late hour that we're in, so I would hold on taking a vote on. We don't have to vote because we already voted to, to purchase the yonder pouches, but we, you know, but we're, we can hold on that as well until we get more information about the other product. Uh, Ms. Oliver, please, and followed by Ms. Rodriguez, please. While we're waiting to buy the pouches, what are we making sure we're implementing in the school so those policy can be enforced? No. What are we doing right now, knowing it hasn't been happening? Kids are still posting stuff on YouTube, TikTok for clicks, for clouds, for likes, for viewers, whatever they're doing, and they're traumatizing their teachers and their um, classmates. So what are we gonna do moving forward while we wait for the pouch to make sure we are implementing this policy? Well, for one, those students that are posting the YouTube videos, there, there's, you know, I can only speak generally about the investigation. It's a Title IX investigation ongoing. Um, those students will, are being dealt with within the discipline process and the and again the Title IX investigation process. Um, at this point in time, we you know there is no real offense. I mean, real way to take the student's phone and, and lock it up as we you voted on last summer. You, of course, you weren't here, but that was a policy was voted in. So um, it, it right now it's it's really you know you know it's it, there's a lot more students and a lot more administrators than what we have right now but we you know we, we're not and i don't intend to task the teachers in the classroom to to police the cell phone policy the, the draft that you have speaks to that and we're still working that out with school administrators to what that looks like in the classroom for one for offense one two and three you know, but, yeah. rodriguez followed by Ms. Azak, please uh, just to pick, piggyback off the salt is the yonder bags are not purchased. Um, I know the yonder bags has more. Of, I'm, not, I'm not sure I haven't seen the other one. Uh, when you say plastic CD cover, like if it, they drop, then phones damaged. Mm -hmm. Those is more durability. Um, the policy is already voted on, but instead of waiting for us to actually physically get these yonder bags, those violations of one, two, and three should be taking effect now. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we get those yarn bags, you are already on number three. Here you go. Right. Um, so it, I, I understand, you know, the lack of staffing in there. It's it's very hard, mm -hmm. but it, it needs to start now. So those students that are out there with those cell phones, put it away. This is your first warning. Stop making those calls to those parents. Listen, your child was uh, violated the policy. This is warning number one. This is number two. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. We have to start tomorrow. Yeah, so I agree, that and that's why we're, we're having this discussion now, because we, you know, in conversations with Vice Chair Ayler, we, you know, we, we agree that, and, and based on the videos that you've seen and, and, and people going around the school uh, recording, um, there's, a, there's an immediate need to do something, and that's why, you know, we decided to re revisit the uh, policy for the cell phones, um, to implement the policy that we had many discussions about last summer with the parent forums, et cetera, before we vote in a different policy, um, so and that's why I think we're looking to implement this policy, the new policy, before the school year ends. Um, realistically, we're looking at the returns from February vacation. It's not realistic. If, the, if this uh, body decides to move forward, we can probably implement it sometime in March, you know, with the, the full new cell phone policy. Um, 
in the interim, we need to decide if we want to buy the pouches now so we can, we can and I talked to the rep, uh, we can have them within a week, you know, the, the yonder pouches if we decide to buy them now. So that's what this body needs to decide and deliberate on and make a decision on. And just point of information because we're talking about potential deficit and how we're going to stop the hemorrhaging. That 137 uh, was mentioned to both Trish, to Troy Clarkson, and also to the agent. So they, they knew that when they were doing these calculations. Uh, Ms. Azak, please. Um, thank you. So quick question. I, I don't remember offhand, but to lease them, what was the lease fee compared to purchasing them? Well, I think that's what uh, Ms. Ayler's mentioned. The lease fee was, was the $12 per pouch, but we, we had an annual fee and we had to purchase you know, more. We'll have to purchase more every year anyway because there'll, there'll be loss, there'll be damage, <coughs> excuse me, and we'll have to replace them. So. Okay. And then... Um, built into the price. So the thing that was concerning is, like many of us, I've seen those YouTube videos and... I know that there's a Title IX investigation, but the, what's very concerning is how I reported them quite a few times, like others, and YouTube will not take them down. And we have mm -hmm. minors, mm -hmm. and given the content of some of these videos, mm -hmm. is it something that we need to reach out to our legislature, like our Congress, reach out to someone to help us? Because not only do you have minors, but one of the videos, I really feel bad for a lot of, a lot of the young right. ladies that are in that video. Um, and they shouldn't be allowed to put that on there. You have names and you have faces and, and medical information. Like, you don't even know. It just, it's concerning that they can get away with that and not take it down and refuse to take it down. Um, so that's the one thing is we, mm -hmm. we probably need to advocate um, at the State House to just, mm -hmm. especially where it's school, you know, um, that's one thing. And then the other, where oh, I drew a blank. We have to imp implement the policies. We do, mm -hmm. I know I heard from a lot of teachers. I'm sure the rest of the committee has. We heard their voices last week. Mm -hmm. We need to start making changes. And everything takes weeks and months to get things done. We can't. We can't mm -hmm. afford to do that. We really have to act on this. Um, if we are going to purchase them, and, and it, we, need, we can't really wait till March, April, May. Mm -hmm. um, we need to start, and like Mr. Rodriguez said, start holding them accountable. So when they do come in, mm -hmm. You know, um, unfortunately, these are our policies, and we are where we are because we haven't enforced the policies for years. And it's sad because we heard from a lot of students tonight. We have some great students in our, our schools. And it's not fair that they're, you know, it, it's affecting, you know, a lot of the students that are here to get an education, come and enjoy their school day. And then you have a handful, well, more than a handful, but you have students that are just coming here and causing disruption. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just not fair. So we do need we do need to enforce that. So if we can try not to delay it, I, I, I thought we allocated funds for this. Um, yeah, we do. I mean, there, there's funds in, in my operations budget that I can I can fund it with now. We're lo we're looking um, towards some sort of grant applications, but for right now, I can fund it out of the operations budget, and I have the purchase order right here, uh, you know, to give to the vendor. Tomorrow, when they show up, but I, I want to make sure the will of the committee is that what we want to move forward with or not. And the you have something to, for Ms. Azek? I, I think for the committee in general, um, I want us. I just want us to be careful. Mm -hmm. A policy is needed. Enforcement of the policy is absolutely needed. Mm -hmm. The number of administrators and floor teachers at Brockton High far outweighs the number of students, as we know. Mm -hmm. We're going to be placing a significant burden on teachers if we don't do this properly, and we're going to make it harder on them. Mm -hmm. That is the last thing any of us wants. I do not want them in additional confrontations. They, they came here to teach children, mm -hmm. not police cell phone policies. So I, I hear you when we talk about we can't wait any longer. The urgency is there. I hear it. I feel it in the teachers. Um, it, it, it's awful. And I've been up there a lot, almost every day. Um, but if we f force it and we don't get their input, one of the things I heard someone earlier talk about when Brockton was a model school, and I was fortunate enough to be part of the Brockton faculty at that time, and we got there because of teacher input. Because every, when, in fact, the Brockton High cell phone policy started through conversations through teachers. It's needed. We are forcing a policy on them. They want it, yes. But we, we 
we need their help with it. And to get their help, we have to understand what it is they need from us besides just the policy. That's just, so that's just my cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. um, every teacher, if you need my email, you can email me if I misspoke. I'm just trying to understand that this is being done to you as mm -hmm. well. And so mm -hmm. we just need, I just want us to be careful. So um, thank you, Dr. Connors. But so our students come in from different access points into Brockton High. Uh, we're going to be adding some, is it access control? We're adding more positions. When they come in, they just put their phones in the yonder bag as they're scanning their IDs. And we take that, little, that pressure off of the teachers. Right. And then if the students throughout the day, I mean, they shouldn't be passing access control or the checkpoint coming into the school as far as um, coming in. Your phone, your yonder bag, and if you don't have a phone on you, then you don't have a yonder bag. Um, but as you walk through the school, as you come in in the morning, that's where we should have it. You know, you well, shouldn't. That, that's how the policy, when it's fully implemented with the new policy, that's not the policy that was voted on on August 15th. So that, that's what the full implementation of the yonder bag program would be. And that's what we're proposing doing perhaps in, in, in March when we've had Again, input from all the stakeholders, the teachers, and the administrators, and we can set up the program correctly. And we, you know, we give parents and students plenty of time to know that this is a new policy. But we don't have that policy in place right now. Any, any additional Ms. Ajax? No, I'm just. <clears throat> no. Okay, Mr. Gold. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Rodriguez, followed by Mr. Gold. <clears throat> I mean, we voted on this. Um, you know, we have the you know, strike one, two, three. Um, it, 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 it's a problem. I don't want to wait another day. The money's there. Uh, I'm ready to make a motion that we approve, purchase these yonder bags tomorrow uh, to make sure that you know we have it within a week's time. Um, those that want to complain which is mostly the students that are not using these phones properly, mm -hmm. they could keep complaining because you guys brought it amongst yourselves. It's the same as you're gonna police yourself, police your peers. So there's a serious problem with the cell phones. Uh, I support it hardly, and this needs to happen tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, Mr. Mr. Gomes, followed by Ms. Ehlers, please. So uh, two things, that's one of the things I was gonna say. My vote is to go ahead and purchase these. Uh, we've seen enough, enough has happened. Um, if we have the funds, of course, go ahead and do it. That would be my vote. Um, if we want to wait, okay, but there is a sense of immediacy there that we shouldn't ignore. The other thing um, before I proceed, I was going to ask, what's the update with the security specialists? Um, we we got, we have like we put it last time we have twelve specialists on hand already and, and they, with six more we have to advertise post the position and do the hiring so so the twelve already work in yes and, yeah um, one thing that I was gonna suggest um, so recently I've been getting those videos the fights and everything is if it's possible to get the security specialists trained and handle with care and uh, personal protection. We're working on that. Restriction. So with with if, Sergeant Livingston and the school police, we're working on that. Training. Okay, so if a fight breaks out, they have the certification, they're trained to actually intervene right. and restrain right. those students. Uh, one of the fights that I saw, nothing was being done and they were just there fighting and beating each other up. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't cost a lot to get the certification. The training is a few hours and you have mm -hmm. to renew every here and there, but mm -hmm. it's, it's very helpful. And I have the training myself for the hospital, it's very helpful. It comes mm -hmm. in handy, so. Thank you, Mr. Gomes. Um, Mrs. Ehlers, please. Yeah, Dr. Cobbs, I just wanted to clarify on the cell phone policy that Dr. Connors had passed out. The red line, is that where we've updated the, for changes? The, the red line where we have questions. <laughs> the whole policy is new compared to what we, what we already passed. So the whole, the whole thing is new. The, 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 what you see in the red is for you to comment on and for us to kind of settle on with between in input from yourselves and the teachers and the administrators. I know I'm going to. This, this whole policy is brand new. So where's the old policy? Um, you should have a copy of it. Sorry. Sorry. 
Yeah, it's, it's in the attachment where you, where you voted on the, the policy. Tab 2. Oh, I don't yeah. remember. Sorry. And it says August um. 15th on it. Okay, so here's my question. Thank you, Rick. Um, so my question is, can we purchase the Yonder bags? Let's say tomorrow's visit goes well. Mm -hmm. You email the team and say, listen, this is what we want to go with. Mm -hmm. Dr. Connors has heard back from her vendor. and We just make a decision to purchase something this week. Let's put it that way. Good. Oh, sorry. Um, does that, I do understand that we want to make sure that we roll this out effectively with the teachers. So mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to purchasing the pouches at all. But I guess my question is, when do you think we'll be ready for a solid policy so that we can kind of marry the two and then come up with a, a plan? We'll have it by the 13th on the policy meeting for the 13th. Perfect. Okay, February on the 13th. Perfect. Next, okay, next week. so then we'll get a kind of a final copy of this right. on the 13th. Right. And we, we again, we like all of you. That's why I gave you a hard copy. We like yep. all of you to comment on it. I can email it if you want an electronic copy. But. We like feedback from all of you on, on this policy. Dr. Cobbs, I just had one question, um, and, and I support this wholeheartedly, but my question is this. I mean, when I went to Brockton High years and years and years ago, 2 or 3 p.m., out the door, right? Either went home, went to practice, whatever. But, but I guess my question is this. When we're going to have a plethora of kids leaving, just explain to me, because I'm not a techie, how, how, do they, how do they get the bag unlocked so that they don't have to be held up? Like, what's... What's the nuances there? Well, those are the things we need to work out again with with the yonder representatives when they come. But they'll have to get the bag unlocked. Um, they they we could give a teacher a classroom. We're not sure if you want to give a classroom teacher the magnet to unlock it, or on the way out they have to get them unlocked by the by the same way they came in. Yeah, so. well, we'll have that answer for the thirteenth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's what the uh, yonder reps will be here tomorrow to kind of look out the, the facility and, and figure out that those logistics. Okay. And. I was say, we went to Springfield, to your point, Dr. Mm -hmm. Point of information, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Exactly. No, 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 go ahead. The floor is yours with point yeah, of information. Okay. So and then what I'm gonna I was going to say is the last, when we were sitting there, uh, Mr. Rodriguez and I were talking to the Springfield superintendent, and mm -hmm. he basically was like, they have, um, you know, five minutes before the bell rings at the end of the day, the classroom teachers unlock everybody's bag mm -hmm. and then they're out the door. They don't mm -hmm. have to be mm -hmm. stopped at security. That's how it works. How yeah. many kids go to that school? Uh, I think it's Springfield Technical, it's 2,300. Was it? Is it three, close yeah. to 3,000? Okay. It was comparable to our mm -hmm. population, mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. why it made sense for us to visit there. But it was that would be the quickest way to do it, the teacher in the classroom just walk around with the magnet. Just five minutes before the bell, she the, walks the, around. The, the, the problem with that is just like similar to the discussion we had last week about the classroom keys. If you lose one of those magnets, it's compromised, and yep. you know, that's, that's a problem. So. And so I do understand They'd have to be that. safeguarded somehow for the teachers. And if they can't leave them in the classroom, leave them in the desk drawer because the kids will get, get old. Uh, Ms. Azak, followed by Ms. Oliver, please. Um, thank you. So um, I recently had an opportunity to spend some time there observing, and there's a lot of kids wandering. Not only are they wandering, they don't have their IDs on them. Mm -hmm. I think enforcing this is going to force them to be accountable where they are during the day. You're not going to get that pouch opened mm -hmm. if you're going to leave school early. Um, and no one's going to open that pouch for you unless you have a pass. And one of the recommendations, and I, I heard from a few um, employees that it was just, if someone is dismissed in their office, in, in the main office, there's no slip, there's nothing. They're not given anything. Mm -hmm. We really need to... Um, figure out a better plan because if a student says to me, I I'm dismissed, I'm I someone's here to pick me up, where's the proof? The office should give them a slip time stamped with that day to show and then when you leave, just hand it to an adult, whoever's standing at the door. I mean, obviously it's not gonna be good after that day, but um, you know, you have seen your privileges, I get it, but we have a lot of kids leaving. We're responsible for them. When they come into the school, mm -hmm. their parents are putting them in our responsibility. Um, we need to account where these students are. God forbid something happens, we need to know who's leaving our schools. Mm -hmm. um, I get it. 
it's not going to be an overnight fix. There's going to be a little bit of pushback, but they're our responsibility when they're under this roof. And I think that will help slow them down because they're not going to be able to leave and wander with, you know, they're going to want that pouch opened. So um, that might slow some of the students that are leaving early. But if we could enforce, um, if we have to put it in the policy, because I'm seeing here the senior senior process, ID process, I mean, they flip their ID over, they sign the back, mm -hmm. and they agree that they're going to sign out at the office. But how do you know they signed out at the office? They should get a slip from the office to show if they're stopped as they're leaving the building. Again, we're responsible for these kids. Um, we need to... We, we need to fine tune a few things, and, and I heard from a lot of a lot of our staff here, and they agree. There's no way of finding out. It's it's their word, and and actually a few of them were sent back to the office. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got to spend some time with the principal as well. So and those are the ones that had their IDs. And I'm all about transparency. There was a lot of kids that were walking around without an ID. Mm -hmm. How did they get into the school without an ID? How? Well, they have them when they get when they come into the school, but they just put them in their pockets or in their backpacks when, when they're walking around the building. So they, but even they, if they e have to scan them to get into the building, unless of course their friends open the door to let them in the building. So that that's my biggest concern is mm -hmm. even if you know who it is at the door mm -hmm. that morning, mm -hmm. no, you have to have your ID. You go to the office, you get a temporary ID, you get something. Mm -hmm. um, we can't have kids walking around without IDs, and there was quite a few of them. Um, I'm being transparent. It was very concerning. So there's no way of finding out who goes to our school. So we definitely need to um, get a better process. Even if you color code the, the paper that they timestamp for the four buildings, at least you know they have a slip and that they actually did check out. Um, it, you know, they dismissed or they have a dismissal. But um, that was very concerning. So we do, I, I would like to see that enforced. Um, it will help the teachers, the floor teachers as well when a student tells them, you know, I'm dismissed or I'm leaving early. Uh, but they have nothing to show rather than have the teacher have to sit and look it up. But so if we can work on that for Tuesday as well, um, whatever we need. Work on what? Getting the office to be accountable for the students that are being dismissed. If a student's dismissed, where's their proof that they got dismissed? Well, they need to show a slip. If they ha there's a bathroom slip to go to the bathroom, you should have a slip to leave the school early. You have to understand that some, like you said, some of the students are older, they can dismiss themselves. They don't need a note from a parent to, to dismiss. That's, that's to be fine. Dismissed. Yeah, so. yeah, it's senior privilege, but they still have to have something to show that they're leaving. Um, they should be the signing office. out at their house, either the house office or the main office, you're right. Yeah, but you're getting a lot of students that are leaving doors that are not even in their house. Well, there was that's a the young problem. lady students, that was in the Students blue. are leaving anyway, out the side door or other, and we, you know, we're, I know Mr. Dwight was working on that, and Mr. Mr. McCaskill's working on it as well, so, you know, it's it's not an open door, open campus policy, but, you know, if It's they, not a college, they shouldn't be leaving you know, the campus. If, if they leave, they leave, you know, and, and, and we can catch up with them if they cut classes, but, you know, the other side of that coin is, Joyce, quite honestly, if they're leaving, they're not a problem in the hallway. They're, they're not kicking doors. They're not in the, in the No, but they are coming the, back, Dr. Corners, Cobbs. But, but they're yeah, leaving and coming back and bringing friends in. That's what we have to control, the coming access coming back into the building. So absolutely right. You're right. Yeah. But again, if we if once you implement this full pouch policy, they won't have incentive to leave because they can't get their pouch unlocked to have their phone. And, yeah, and, and well, that's going to slow them down. They won't be wandering and meeting each other in the bathroom because they can't use their phones. They're not going to be able to leave and come back because what's the point if you leave the building and you don't have your phone? So there's, so there's, there's, yeah, this has to be developed and has to be implemented you know, the right way, and that's what we're trying to make sure that we do and not rush it. So. But in the interim, you know, the, the one, two, three policy that you voted on already, we, we can implement if we purchase the product. I know a few other committee members are just, it's time we just really need to do. We need to show our teachers and our staff mm -hmm. and some of the students that we're hearing their voices. We have to start making some changes. Um, and I know I'm, I'm for it and I'm ready to vote on it tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Azos. Ms. Oliver, please. Just to piggyback, I definitely, I agree. I think we should vote it on tonight. And once they come tomorrow, we're ready to porch, um, basically purchase the pouch. Um, just to second thing on that is that if we are going to be buying this, um, especially on the money we're spending on it, we got to figure out returning keys to the teachers uh, because some of the pictures that I've received on emails regarding vandalism in the classroom because they are students are able to go in the classroom, mm -hmm. 
and destroying computers, um, that's unacceptable. So we need mm -hmm. to figure out this whole key system with the teachers. If we're going to be spending this much money, we got to make sure they're locked and safe. We actually have a meeting scheduled for Thursday, I believe it is, to meet with, with uh, Chief Perez and, and our facility staff, you know, locksmith, to, to work on that because, again, that was kind of an edict from the police department as far as handing the keys out because, they get, again, we, at the last meeting, they talked about active shooter and, and lockdown procedures. So, you, again, you lose one key and you compromise the whole building. Uh, so that, we're going to work on that policy and figure that out. Nelson, Ms. Holden, any other questions relative to this matter? Seeing none, we'll move on. Um, consent agenda. Um, sorry, Mayor, was there, a, was there a vote or was there a consent to? Oh, to oh I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> form of a mo is there a form it's of a, a motion? It's a form of motion to uh, approve the purchase. Second. Do you want to state a hard dollar amount on that or no? I, I don't think I can say. It. Okay. The yonder bags. Yonder bags. For the yonder bags. Mm -hmm. Quantities. How many do you have to buy? 4,000. Form of a motion uh, made by Ms. Oliver was properly. We do we have a, do we have a total of cost and we can afford it? Y yeah, just point of information. We, we I was given a figure of 137 by the act superintendent. So if you um, want you want the actual number, Mayor, the, the actual I have a purchase order here. So, so it's uh, 137,205 dollars. And, and that was the and figure that we we already told T.J. Troy Clarkson and, and Trish. That. That's already been factored in. Uh, for that, I said 137. It's a little bit over 137. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, form of a motion made by Ms. Oliver was properly seconded by Mr. Gomes uh, to acquire 4,000. How do you say the word? Yonda bags. Yonda, yonda bags. Yonda. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. It passes unanimous. Thank you. Um, so, agenda five is a consent agenda. Uh, we do have A, B. C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. I know Dr. Cobbs wanted to just talk about C before we uh, entertain it. Um, Dr. Cobbs? Yes, uh, for the consent agenda item C, uh, I, I received an email from uh, the director, Dr. DeBarros, uh, regarding the, the, the date to implement the policy. She wanted to change it from February 20th, which you have in your packet, to February 26th when the students return from the uh, vacation, from the holiday break. Winter break. Is it a form that, that of a motion to accept that change from the 20th to the 26th motion relative to, to agenda six, uh, C? Motion to accept the change for um, the rate increase for the Smart Start Extended Day. Thank you. Is there a second on that to change it from February 20th to the 26th? On the motion. On the motion, Ms. Rodriguez, please. The second so, was made by Mr. Sullivan, but on the motion, please. So we're looking to increase this right after the February vacation? Right. Now, it, <clears throat> has the has families been notified about this increase? Because yes. It, it, it yes, well, it, it will. Yeah, I believe Dr. DeVos has already sent it out to the families that are already affected by this. The rate will change, but I believe she had sent it out for the twentieth, and she wanted to change it to the twenty-sixth. And what effect is this going to have if this increase doesn't get voted on? If we don't approve it tonight, well, you'll, what what effect will it have on, on with this increase? Because you know it, it's you know families are paying for extended day, right? What's the you know? So they'll they'll get a little relief for that one week before we get, implement the policy for the for the vacation week, because they, they'll they'll have more hours actually during the vacation the winter break um, to pay the new new fee. What, what I'm asking is, we're increasing the, the rates of what families are paying for extended day. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, if this body doesn't approve this rate increase, what effect does it have on us financially? So it, it would be, we would, wouldn't we, we collect the additional revenues until after the vacation weekends. Um, I actually have an email from Dr. DeBarros um, that she said that since students are registered to attend the February vacation session, she'd like to propose a date to change to the end um, and contact parents to let them know the official change. So I think the design was to give parents um, 
we leave for doctor, that week. Doctor, just for clarification, I, I, I think what we're saying is, uh, what Mr. Rodriguez is saying is, if this body doesn't agree to an increase right. and it stays what the current amount is, what financial impact would that have? Well, I, I don't know the exact dollar amount, but the financial impact is they won't collect the additional, the new fees until, until one, after the vacation ends, which, again, that will impact the families because they will, they will spend more money for more hours during that winter break week. So, so we'll, we'll not collect some additional revenues until that, that the impact, really. I don't have a dollar figure for that. I don't think that it, it's, it's more, <clears throat> so what I'm saying is, a family is paying twenty ninety one for an after school program. Right, they're paying that continuously, and it's going to increase um, slightly three and some change to twenty four thirty two. Mm -hmm. If we don't approve this increase for the remainder of the year, what? How is that going to impact us financially? We'll lose money, and 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 the other thing is we we won't be able to charge the rates because we we have to match the rate that the federal government is going to pay us pay us. So we won't be able to collect those revenues because we can't match the 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 fees to the parents. So that would basically put us in a deficit with on the community schools. Um, I don't know, but it was in a deficit. We wouldn't collect as much money because you know it's. You know, I don't. Again, I don't have a dollar figure, but I don't think it's that much money for that one week. I'm talking about overall because this, the, the vote that we're going to take is for. You the mean vote not year. to implement the the rate increase at all? Yeah, um, we will lose money. So that's a deficit. Right. Well, if you don't if you don't increase the rates, because the government is going to pay us the rates, and it, and it's going to be retroactive back to August, I believe. July. So if we don't, then we will lose all, we'll lose all that money all the way retroactively back to to the summer. So yeah, that's so that's the impact. We'll we'll lose a lot of money. It won't put us in a deficit, but it, it's money that we we didn't didn't account for in the budget in the first place. So it would have been additional revenues to come in if we don't vote to to do that. Then we won't collect those revenues, and and we'll still have the revenues anyway that we would have had, but we wouldn't have the additional revenues. So it wouldn't put us in a deficit. It just would, we're losing out on revenue <laughs> because we're going to collect the monies anyway that we would have. So we would. So looking at the the document here from uh, so the school district was notified on January seventeenth of these rate increases. Mm -hmm. Or I'm just I just want to make sure, man, because that's like a short time. You figure that we would get more time, you know, ahead of time to. You know, increase some rates. You know, because this is gonna, some this is gonna. You know, it, even though it's a, you know, to some people it's a small number, but this is gonna impact a lot of families. With mm -hmm. once we increase this, because once we increase this, you know, I've already gotten some calls on it. Like, right, right. you know, January seventeenth, and today's the sixth, and they want us to vote on it. It's gonna take effect within two weeks, three weeks, if that. Right. So understand, if you read this, it's it's a mandated increase like by the government. It's not really a choice. You know, we we're just deciding when to implement it. A point of information, um, Mr. Sullivan, you have some information about this. Yes, historically, the Brockton Public Schools has accepted each incremental increase mandated by the EEC. Mm -hmm. This is a, a EEC a mandate. mandate. Right, exactly. They could pull the programs on you, mm -hmm. okay? Which gradually raises the private paid tuition, and keeps the contractor in good standing. And every school committee has voted this in because these programs are very important to parents mm -hmm. for the care of their children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and these are rates for private pay again. It, it, you know, it, it doesn't change the vouchers. Some families will still qualify, and, it, and the rate increase will be paid through the voucher. But these are for private pay families. So, but it, it's really, like I said, you will miss out on a lot of revenues, and and, and uh, it's it's a mandate. I understand it, but it's just the time. It's just the time frame. You know. Exactly. They can pull the vouchers because we're not charging the rate that, that they're paying us. That, that's that's uh, where I'm getting at. It's that you know just the timing of it. Mm -hmm. You know when we were notified on the 17th, it's like here you go. You guys have two weeks to implement this. You know some families have to plan out mm -hmm. ahead of time. You know so it's going to be a burden on a lot of. No, families. we 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 didn't. We got the notice when, and we gave it out as soon as we got the notice. Yeah, I mean I that's when so. the government gives it to us and they give us a date certain to, to implement it, and that's what we need to do. Any follow-ups, Mr. Rodriguez? I'm also, thanks. Mr. Gomes, followed by Ms. Azak, please. 
I was just gonna say, is it possible to postpone and then vote it on a like at a later date just to extend the time that people have to adjust? You can do whatever you want, but again, the government mandate is what you have to be be cognizant of. You know. Mm -hmm. Any follow, follow up? Yeah, I'm also, thank uh, you. Ms. Azak, please. Um, thank you. So I know these, these are mandates, but uh, years before, they've always given us time, and it's always been a few months to at least notify families. I This is a short time. Mm -hmm. um, do they notify us? before this and we just finally when when did the letters go out to the families because January, i know it's an extra like five dollars for example mm -hmm. after school it's an extra you know say four dollars but if you have if you have a few students if you have a few kids in in after school programs mm -hmm. it adds up for a lot of families that are already um financially struggling mm -hmm. um so to at least give them give them some time but in years past i think last time we did this i thought they gave us a few months to notify the families. We, if you see in, in your packet, there's a copy it's never of the letter. It's been this short from, time, from, a, a couple of weeks. A, it's January 17th is when, when the letter was sent out to us. So we, we notify them as quickly as possible. Huh? So. Okay, last time we did this, do you remember offhand? Anyone remember offhand? I want, I, it wasn't that long ago. I remember it wasn't Dr. that long I, I ago. I think Dr. DeBarros was here maybe a year or two ago. Yeah, yeah and I don't remember it being just a couple of weeks. Right. But um, yeah, that's, that's what the they only thing. Like, you know, it's when I get these emails and I send them to Dr. DeBarros right away, and then, then you know, we, we implement and put this together for you to uh, vote on. No, I understand that it's, it's mandated. I, I understand that. It's just, I just, I'm curious to see what kind of feedback we got from some of the families given the short. Um, mm -hmm short time frame that's the only thing I know we have to follow when's our next meeting after this just, regular meeting I'm just trying to remember 13th we have a meeting and then 13th we have sub yeah sub. Yeah. and then school vacation week right? right and then yeah. we meet again that next week right. yeah it's, it's we have, we have two subcommittee meetings the 13th and the 27th it's truly noted that it, it's you know it's only given the parents a two weeks advance notice in the document mm -hmm. but you know you know, you have some parents, three or four children in the district. It's that's that's big money for some some of those parents, and I understand it's a mandate, but I'm just questioning the timing of it because you know the last time I know we had more than just two weeks just to vote on this measure. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's something that we post not postponing the vote as far as approving the rate increase, but as far as from the February 20th of a two-week notice to give at least a 30-day notice to families. Um, whatever implication that's going to take financially, then we own it. Dr. Cobbs, would there be an so ability? I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not ignoring it. I'm just getting texts from uh, Deputy Wolder and from Dr. DeBarros. Um, typically, but John Wolder says that we typically give two weeks notices, and, and Dr. DeBarros says it went into effect right away. So this is not out of the norm for what we typically do. So. Any other question? Hmm? Well, first of all, I guess I guess we didn't take we didn't take anything collectively or out, so we just wanted to get point of information mm -hmm. from Dr. Cobbs on C. Mm -hmm. Do we do we want to as a committee um, take these collectively? Do we want to hold back C for a minute? What, what's the will of the committee? I just have a um, Mrs. Sullivan, please. On F. On F. Jamie could answer it for me. Dr. Jamie's here. Yeah, yeah he is. On the Reeds Collaborative, just second. The Reeds Collaborative um, yes, that's what membership. Yes. Uh, Dr. Jamie, I know you've done a lot of work on that. And um, I just had a question on the cost of our membership. There is no cost. Uh, so back in September of 22, I uh, presented to the committee. Uh, there was a full unanimous approval for uh, to uh, engage in membership. Um, we submitted our application. 
Dr. Cobbs and I visited the Board of Directors meeting earlier this fall. Uh, we were unanimously approved for membership. Uh, and then the other uh, member district school committees also have voted affirmatively to allow us to join. So before you this evening is the uh, vote of the Brockton School Committee to join the REITS Collaborative. So back in that original presentation, there is no membership fee, but we do commit to four slots in the neuropsychological uh, clinic that's housed at REITS. So there's no cost. That is correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you for all your work on it too. We appreciate the support of the committee. Exactly. Committee members, um, what, what is the will of the committee? Because we, we do have quite a few of these on the consent agenda. Do we want to take any out or do we want to, um, Ms. So Ailis, We please? can just, to, may I, if, I, if I may, um, I just got a text again from Dr. DeBarrels and we can push it back to March 1st if you, if you wish, if that's the will of the committee so we can give parents more time to. Um, I would support that. Those. Mm -hmm. So, so we're not there yet, but that. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mrs. Ayers, I was going to motion to approve consent agenda collectively A through I. Second. I think it would be helpful if we took C out. I agree. I agree. Well, we agree that, that March first is okay. Well, we agree that March first is okay because there's no date. Just have to take a form of a motion, and then we can right. take it collectively as amended. Mm -hmm. So, okay. There's no date in there, so why do we have to take it out? The, we're, I mean, we spoke to the date being the, going from the 20th to the 26th, right. and now we're talking March 1st. So, what? Why do we have to take it out? Don't we just? Right. It's, I would just. Get the I would, just, I would reflect that in the actual vote because it would be the will gotcha. of this committee, and we okay. want the minutes to reflect that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, approval to take the consent agenda collectively with C. Um, caveat being that we are going to roll that out beginning March 1st versus February 26th after February vacation. Good. Form of a motion. Is there a second on that? Second. Uh, motion was made by Mrs. Ayla's, properly seconded by Mr. Gomes. Before we take the vote, I just have to read it, and I'll read it wicked fast. A is approval of minutes, a special school committee meeting uh, dated January 23rd, 2024. B is approval of minutes, special school committee meeting dated January 9th, 2024. Approval uh, of the rate increase. Uh, smart start extended date as amended by uh, the motion. D is the approval of the African American Association of Brockton Future Leaders Scholarship. Uh, e is approval of uh, BHS over overnight field trip request to DECA, Boston Mass, March 7th through 9th, 2024. F is the approval, and thank you, uh, Jamie, of the BPS membership uh, into the REITS Collaborative. G is request for authorization to submit proposal and expenditures of funds. Uh, Jeez, my eyes are terrible. Ninth French dual language fund annual grant cycle in the amount of 10,000. Influence of a 100 grant fellowship in the amount of 2,000. H, request for authorization to amend proposal and expenditures of funds. FY 2024, FC 205 217 strategic trans trans transformation area grant in the amount of $11,455. I, acceptable, acceptance of human resources notifications, appointment certified personnel, appointments non-certified, and then finally personal actions, leaves of absences, resignations, requirements. We have a motion that was properly seconded. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. Uh, it passes unanimous, and then C was amended with the date of March 1st. We will now go on to six unfinished business. Uh, A is presidential election, March 5, 2024, polling locations update. I can give an update as a chair. I, uh, I met with Chief Brenda Perez this morning um, relative to the request to have additional police presence because it's a school day. Again, we do have uh, police, their detail offices at the polls. That's standard. What Chief Perez, and I already talked to Dr. Cobbs about it uh, tonight when we got here, she has asked that uh, Dr. Cobbs contact her so she can coordinate additional police uh, presence for safety mechanisms. Uh, Ms. Azek. Thank you. Um so the extra the extra police presence that that who's carrying that cost is it going to be the state I, um I, I don't have that answer for you we can find out through chief i don't think the state will cover that because it's a city oh. it's a city of um we we've decided to do that as a city okay but we could i'll ask cindy hogan to check with the secretary of state to see just because i mean now we know moving forward to um to close the schools, you know, we'll put it on the calendar for four years from now, but um, it's a safety issue. But again, the cost of this, I mean, it's just, that's a lot of police officers all day long from like six in the morning till who knows, maybe 10 o'clock at night. 
Um, I just, as long as it's not going to be on the school part. Yeah, again, I don't have that answer, but what okay. I can do is, is the chief will meet with the with doctor. They can come up with a plan. Um, again, not, only, not at every polling location in the city of Brockton is at a school. And then I'll ask uh, uh, Cindy Hogan, uh, Cindy Scrivani, to reach out to the secretary to see if there's any type of grant funding. I appreciate that. Sure. Any Thank other you. questions relative to the presidential election? So do we need to vote on that uh, to approve the polling locations? No. The polling locations are set by the state. I mean, approve. She usually sends out her letter. Um, we don't have to approve anything. No, because okay. they're not changing any locations this year. Okay. Yep. Um, but I will have her send a letter just to confirm where they all are for you. Um, B is review and potential vote on subcommittees. I, I don't think that that's really before us this night, but that's whatever the committee chooses. Uh, Ms. Ayler's, please. Um, I think we were trying to put together the remainder collective bargaining agreement, Ms. Azak. Isn't that what, um, I think that's why this is on here? I yes, wrong. yes, um, but after tonight's discussion, I mean, I know we still have to, um, we put this on here because Mrs. Ehlers and myself were on the um, bargaining for the food oh, service contract. Okay. Um, and I that should have. why was it? Okay, okay. So it's, it, it was on there for the food service contract. And, but given, you know, we'll have to talk to our attorney. Um, I mean, I guess we can approve to have the, the third member added tonight just so we can have that, um, just so we can go back and forth with our attorney and with um, the union. Um, as far as like scheduling things or reviewing things, but we had um, we were going to add Mrs. Miss Oliver on there as a third member, so it would be myself. Um, I chaired it last year. Yep. Uh, myself, Mrs. Ehlers, and Miss Oliver to the food service negotiations. Sub, uh, Is that the form of a motion? Sure, a motion to approve myself, Mrs. Ehlers, and Miss Oliver to serve on the negotiations for the food service. Ms. Oliver, do you accept that? Actually, actually, I was going to amend that motion and add Mr. Gomes and have them get their feet wet because um, we yeah. only have one contract coming up so, so they can get some experience in uh, contract negotiations. So why don't we do this? There's a motion on the floor. Do you want to Sure, we can motion? add four members. Okay. Is that what you – sure. Yeah. So a motion to um, add myself as chair of the food service negotiations, Mrs. Ehlers to serve, Ms. Oliver and Mr. Gomes. So that would be a four-member negotiation. Yeah. Form, form of a motion. Is there a second? I second that. Second was made. <laughs> Ms. All, all, all in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, that carries. Thank you very much. Uh, let the minutes reflect that the two, two newest members are now joining the subcommittee. Thank you very much for that. Um, I do need to um, read the following, which is agenda item seven, uh, executive session, Mass General Law, chapter 30A. 20... Can you turn that light up a little bit, please? I'm not joking. 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair uh, so declares, and it's BSPA, uh, Access Control Officers. Uh, I need to take a motion to go into executive session. So motion made, is there a second? Motion was made by Mrs. Sullivan, was properly seconded by Mrs. Ehlers. I have to read the roll. Um, Mrs. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Gomes? Yes. Ms. Ehlers? Yes. Ms. Oliver? Yes. Ms. Rodriguez? Yes. Ms. Azak? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. I'm a yes as well. We've been going into executive session, but I will let you know we will be coming back into formal session. So we will be coming back into open session. We will go into executive session at this time. We are back into uh, formal session. We're on agenda item number nine. Uh, I'm sorry, eight new business. Uh, number one is ratification of the MOA, Brockton School Committee, and Teamsters Local uh, Union 653 Access Control Officers. Uh, and the specific date is February 6, 2024 through June 30th, 2024, and then July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2027. Is there a motion? Is there a motion relative to the ratification of the MOA? 
This is relative to the access control officers. Motion to approve the MOA for the access control officers um, collective bargaining agreement. It's a form of a motion by, made by Mrs. A. Is there a second? Second. Many, many. I'm going to give that to Mrs. Sullivan. Uh, all in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hands. It does pass. Uh, so agenda 8-2 is the discussion of potential vote regarding the regular school committee meetings uh, Tuesday, March 5, 2024, and then Tuesday, May 7, 2024. Location change from here, which is the George M. Rom Little Theater, Brockton High School, to where we were last week, the Dr. William H. R. Known Theater on Belmont Street at 7 p.m. Is there a form of a motion? Motion to approve uh, the um, relocation of the March 5th, uh, 2024 meeting in the May 7th, 2024 meeting from uh, Brockton High School Little Theater to the Dr. William R. Known Theater, um, 7 p.m. for form both the, meetings. Form of the motion made by Ms. Azek. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Ms. Ms. Oliver uh, made the second. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hands. It does pass. Agenda item nine is announcements. Uh, Mrs. Ayles, do you have an announcement this time? I do have an announcement. Um, I would like to make a motion for to form a BESPA negotiation subcommittee. Comprised of what membership? Comprised of BESPA for, sorry, I'm a mess right now. BESPA. No, who, who would be on it from this committee? Oh, yeah. um, my bad. I mean, no, 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 no worries. <laughs> um, it would consist of myself, yes, Miss um, Oliver, yes, Mr. Gomes, and Miss Sullivan. Okay, it's a form of a motion um, to add subcommittee, which would be Miss Oliver, Mr. Gomes, Mr. Sullivan, Mrs. Ayers. Uh, is there a second on that, please? Second. Second made by Miss Rodriguez. Uh, all in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hands. That does pass. Agenda 9, also announcement. I've, I've asked Attorney Spotterford to please give us an update relative to the audit, which was discussed quite a bit tonight. Um, the contract has not been signed yet, um, but Sarah's going to give us some information relative to that. Good evening. All right. Thank you. Just very briefly, um, we are still in active negotiations with RSM. Uh, they sent us the contract uh, mid-December, so you voted to appoint them in mid November 15th, I believe, and then they sent us the contract around that same date in December. Um, and we gave some initial feedback around the holidays and heard back shortly thereafter. Uh, right now, what we're working on is the city has some mandatory terms and conditions that it requires of all city contracts, which are different than what private sector companies are used to dealing with. So they have they've pushed back on some, and some are non-negotiable. So we're, we're working on that. They've uh, agreed to, I would say, 90% of our changes. Uh, the last piece they have running by their legal team, I spoke to them today. Uh, they anticipate having the contract for me tomorrow with, with hopefully an agreement on this last term. Um, we also were very cognizant that we want the scope to reflect what you agreed to in the RFP, which was not what was initially in the form that we received. So. Uh, we want to make sure it's clear what the scope of work is since it's a significant financial commitment from the school committee. Um, they are still able to start once we sign the contract. Uh, the contract is currently, um, so I, I anticipate having it hopefully tomorrow and the city solicitor has been super responsive to provide her feedback as well. It's set up just to have the mayor sign as chair of the school committee um, just for expediency. It, you only need one person to bind the committee. I will send the copy of the contract to everybody once I have it in final form so that you can all see it. And if there's any concerns, you can certainly reach out to me to let me know. I'll make sure you have 24 hours at least to, to review it before we execute it. Um, it's acknowledged by me so that there's some level of attorney-client privilege attaching to uh, the correspondence when we need it to. Uh, but it's going to be deci your decision what's made public. Um, and I know that the committee's committed transparency. So you don't have to invoke that attorney-client privilege. It's just there as a tool for you if you, if you need it. Um, so that's the status update. I know it's taken a while, uh, but we are, we are working on it. It's hard when there's so many people involved and they have a large company and their legal department's not as fast as one would always hope. Um, but they are committed still to the project and hopefully we'll be able to resolve this last issue. 
Attorney Spotterford, thank you. I, what's confusing to me and disappointing to me is, is they, I mean, we interviewed, right? And so they knew what the scope was. And you and Megan have been working on it. I haven't been. But when they didn't put the price in the original draft, that was troubling. You have to define the price. And then when the scope that they knew that we selected them on was a different scope than they put in their contract, that's a little bit of an issue, uh, a big issue. But you've, you're confident that it's worked out. We are basically just lifting the RFP response into the contract now. So it'll be exactly what you've agreed to, uh, what you selected um, through the RFP process. And then the remainder of the terms, um, the city solicitor and I have gone through them repeatedly and we feel very confident they're reflective of A, city procurement best practices, and then uh, secondarily things that would get you the product that you're anticipating getting. So um, again, this normally wouldn't take so long. It was a very different type of agreement than I've ever seen in this format and same with the city solicitor. And so we've been, we've been working on it, but I think, we're, I think we're there and they're very committed to getting this done quickly. Any uh, questions from the membership? Uh, Ms. Azak, please. Um, thank you. Thank you, Attorney Spada, for. Mm -hmm. So I get it. It's a contract and we need to be extra cautious, but it took way too long. Um, a lot of I, I watched the city council meeting last night I mean and I'm hearing from a lot of constituents everybody wants to know where the audit is we want to know where the audit is sure. um, can we put a little pressure like this needs to be done before next week I have put that pressure on I've told them that needs to be we'd like it executed this week um, and so again they've told me that their law department should get it back to me tomorrow so Either this week or we move on to a different company right like this is you're costing us money and and I know that last night um, the council the city council um, we bought a little bit of time a little bit of time on working with the MSBA for years three of us sat Mr. Sullivan, Mrs. Sullivan, and myself for many, many years sat on this committee while we submitted applications. We finally get to this point. We've never gotten to this point, mm -hmm. and we might lose it. And it's just with everything going on with the money, um, the deficit, and I, I get it, but we've never gotten this close. Sure. And to, to lose, um, lose what we, we worked so hard to get to, it could be another 10, 15 years, probably 15 years before we even see a new school. Um, so that's that's huge. No, um, so I know a lot of them. We bought a little bit of time with the council. They expect some kind of answers. I, I think March is is kind of cutting it close. But I think with an update, maybe once the audits get started, they might be able to give us a little bit of an update. But again, we can't expect the city council to hand over money when they don't have any answers from us. Um, sure. I mean, we don't have answers. But um, enough. I mean, this is it. Like. They knew time is of the essence. We have, we have administrative leave. We're paying costs. People on medical, administrative, you know, it's costing our district money until we get some answers as to what's going on and what happened. But um, I don't know about the rest of the committee, but we need to know. Today's Tuesday. They're a big firm. They can get us the answers. It shouldn't take them two months to get us what we need. Um, so I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Rodriguez, please. Thank you. I, yeah, I'm kind of disappointed, you know, voting November to de December with contracts. And, you know, here we are in February and we still haven't had a contract signed and we need to figure out exactly what happened. And um, this is a forensic audit that, that's going to... So it's not technically an audit. What you approved for the RFP is a review. An audit's done by an auditing... It's done by a separate auditor and it's under different standards, but... The RFP response, if you look at it, is it's for auditing services, but you're not getting a certified audit, right? It's not like what the city auditor provides you. I just want to be clear about what the scope is going to be, um, because that's where we've bumped a little bit, truthfully, with them, because they were they wrote into the scope, we're not performing an audit. And I said, well, wait a minute, that doesn't feel like what the committee thinks is happening. Um, so when we looked at the RFP response, right, it, it, it provides it's really a review of what, what went wrong, how did the deficit come to be, using auditing practices, but they're not providing you a certified audit. They're providing you a report of their findings. But to be clear, it's not a certified audit that you could rely upon to say, because you already have one of those, right? An audit was performed on FY23 by the city, internally and external, on the school committee books. Um, so this is slightly different than that. I just, again, that was one area that, become very familiar with since we've been trying to make sure it was clear. Um, so it's 
It's a review using best auditing practices, uh, which is what all the RFP firms, when you looked at their responses, because they're because they are auditing firms, they're careful about using the term providing an actual audit. So the, the review audit, yep. however we want to determine, it's going to tell us exactly what happened, Correct. when it happened, and so forth. My other question, this is for the mayor. And, and just point of information, they did say forensics that night. So they talked about the FBI it's, and the U.S. Attorney's yeah. Office and all that. Yeah, so. so it's a forensic yeah. analysis, review, however, review analysis, however yeah. emails and so forth. I, I watched the city council meeting, but the funding, the 2.5, does it have to come from the city council? Yes. Because yes, MSBA requires there has to be a lawful vote of the legislative body, which in our form B type of government is the city council. So when you say lawful body, meaning that you know we have ESSER funds that no, it has to, it does it has have to, to be. Come from, they, they've made it clear. Yeah, it has to be a vote. It has to be the mayor, not me, as on the school committee. The mayor putting the order forward, certified by the CFO, which we both did, and then the authorization has to come from the body that authorizes money, which in Brockton is the city council. Okay. That's what Ms. Sutton, remember, because we were on that call. The, the reason why I'm asking is, is, you know, I don't know if legal can look into this, is that that feasibility study is with then the school district, which is controlled by the governing body, which is the school committee. So if, if it's, you know, a funding of getting this, we're authorized yeah, they, of approving I, that. So that's why I'm we asking. We can ask. I'm, I'll be happy to ask Mrs. Her name's Allison Sullivan. Ms. Allison, I'm because happy to. It, but they made it clear when we were on that Zoom for three hours, right? I mean, yeah. that we had to give them the city council timeline, which is what I was trying to explain last night to them. And only the city council in Brockton authorizes appropriations of money from the city. Even though this is a school building, it's still owned by the city. It's just under the care and custody of the schools. Yeah. So, but I'll ask her. I mean, can't yeah, hurt. I, I mean, yeah. the, what I'm looking at, I mean, is that if we're getting this pushback, and I truly understand because of the, the financial crisis is where we have ESSA funds, which is used by this body, whatever we vote how to use those funds, if we're going to get that pushback because 10 years of trying to get this project done, we have the ability, the authority to execute that $2.5 I think it'll be wisely to use some of that ESSER funds mm -hmm. as of right where I'm looking at it right now before we, you know, we get the actual answers if we can or cannot or what implications that will have. Mm -hmm. If I may comment on that, um, again, last night at the, the city council meeting, the $2.5 million is, if you will, a, a down payment of deposit. It's just to purchase the, the facility uh, feasibility study but it, it, the vote will, is a commitment for up to possibly $200 million. So okay. we're, we're, we're buying two, $2.5 million to commit the city to $200 million. That, I mean, that's what you're doing, and they're not going to go for that. I'll ask, though. I'll ask. I mean, they, they made it clear to us, but I'm happy to ask them. Can't hurt. Uh, I think they're going to say no, but we'll ask them. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Any, uh, any other questions at this time? And I also concur with what Ms. Azak said. If, if they want to work with the city of Brockton and, and they're not going to get the contract done, we have to move on to another. I mean, we interviewed three and we all agreed that this was the best, but I don't. No, I agree. We, we spoke to, uh, today and, and Megan and I, uh, the city solicitor and I both said, you know, if we can't get it done, then maybe we call a special meeting for you all to be able to pick a different firm if, if we need to go that direction. So can you can you give an um can you give an update to this entire body yeah. um as soon as you know from I'll them? send an email Please. as soon as I know anything. I'll try to keep you updated throughout the week and certainly if you have any questions you you all know how to get a hold so, of me. Sarah, uh, okay. Oh go ahead Jim and I'll go to Ms. Azek. So just uh, also you know at the finance committee last night we, you know we know we have until the end of March the last finance committee so yep. when we talk to the firm can they see what they can get to us before then? But they possibly, did say they, they can, can start immediately. I confirmed that again today because obviously the take? timeline has changed a bit from when yeah. they first interviewed, and I don't know what other business they, they have, but they mm -hmm. confirmed very quickly that they can get on this immediately. I will share with them. I, 
I've been cautious not to do a lot of information sharing mm -hmm. because they're a third party, mm -hmm. um, but until we have that contract in place, but I can certainly share with them the um, added urgency mm -hmm. given, uh, and I, I apologize, I wasn't at city council, but my understanding is- Oh, it was great, you should have been there, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> we need a, an update, right, by at least- we, by um, No, they are gonna take a formal a vote, they postponed it after, I don't know, a while, and I would have done the same thing if I was them, um, but they are looking for us to give them an update, and I told them I can't give an update on the investigation because I'm not involved in it, but Megan can. Yep. But from the school side, they want us to give them an update. But the 18th is their drop dead date for us to go back before them to see if they're either going to approve it or, or not allow it. Okay. So, but they aren't necessarily looking for the uh, the review to be done. They just want a substantial update. I mean, in a perfect it'd be world, nice it would, if it would be, but if, if you yeah. could, you know, really. If they could. I don't know if a month's reason. I, truthfully, I'm not sure if they can get it done in a month. I can certainly talk to them about what the fastest timeline. They could, they Attorney Spot, if give us a time frame. I yep, can report back to Mr. Rodriguez, the Council President, who's the chair of the FinCom. Yep. yep. To make sure they know. Absolutely, I'll get that information. Anything else for Sarah at this time, Ms. Azak, please? Um, thank you. Can we um, request Attorney Bridges to give us an update? on their investigation? I can ask her again, I because I'm wearing two hats as mayor and as the chair, I'm not involved, but uh, we can ask her. She probably would do it in executive session. Yes, that's what but, I think. But um, I will ask her, tomorrow. she definitely would do it in executive session because it's ongoing, but I will talk to her tomorrow morning at 8.30 when I get to City Hall. Okay, thank you. I might just drive there from here to there if we stay here long enough. <laughs> Any, uh, anything else before us tonight? Um, then I'm going to ask humbly for an adjournment so we can all go home tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> motion made by Mr. Selvin. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Thank you very much. Good night and drive careful. <laughs>